you know, start dropping some good conversation here. <laughs> Keep it going. Um, so, um, yeah, that emotion of the, of the composition is, is really the, the design aspect of the process. Um, I'm just going to turn my phone on, uh, off, I mean, so we're not interrupted here. Um, and that's like the, you know, the, the communication design aspect of, of, of all of this. Um, and then, so that's, you could also call that like the heart part of it, right? Um, and then, and then the head part of it, you know, uh, really gets into the structure aspect of composing your work. So, um, and we do both. Um, and then we also do what we call like the belly part of it. <laughs> so, you know, there's the heart, there's the head and the belly of making a, a great work of art. Um, okay. Can you tell me what the belly part of making art is? Well, actually, if I was going to do all three of them, I would say that the story would be the he I mean, the heart, right? That's that um, intuitive part of it right? What is your story? What is it that you're trying to communicate? And then the instinctive part would be your design, right? That's kind of where the transition from that intuitive part kind of steps over into like the real, um, goes from the invisible to the real. And then when the head part, that's what we call space. And that's the composing. That's when we get into grid work and, and it adds the math, if you will, to, to the artwork. Um, and so that's, the, that's that real intentional part of, of the work. And so each, each area has its own, like, you know, kind of its own intelligence, like emotional intelligence, the IQ, if you will, and then just that, that grit, um, part of it. So, uh, you know, so as you go through this, this entire process, you get to touch on all of those different places, um, so, but you got to start with, with your story. You got to know what it is that you want to say. Because if you don't, then you're just kind of like, blah, 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 you know. Um, so you got to get really, really clear on what is it that you want to communicate. Um, I, have, I have a problem um, understanding that from a standpoint of the work that I do. Um, I get the story when you are dealing with a figurative or a portrait. Um, obviously, you've got um, personalities happening there. You are definitely telling a story about a person or about what the people are doing. But to me, it's much harder to um, evaluate or interpret what that story is when you're talking about like a still life or a landscape. Well, Cezanne said it this way. Cezanne said, he said, um, uh, the goal is to, is to capture the sensation, right? Is to, is, you can say share that sensation, right? So what is, when you're looking at a landscape or you're looking at that um, still life, what is the sensation that you're getting? And it's not in the form it's not copying the form that tran that translate the sensation to the viewer. You have to look past it. So sometimes if you're looking at a figure, let's say at a you know, figure drawing class or whatnot, it, sometimes it, it might just be what captures you might be like the way the a light hits the shoulder, right? It's not everything. Um, and so it's just becoming very uh, in tuned and being very sensitive to what it is that's, that's capturing your eye. Um, it might be the space between two flowers, right? It might be the way a leaf is, is, is leaning. And you want to be sensitive to that because, in my opinion, what's happening is that still life is calling to you, saying, paint me, paint me. Not paint the entire, right? But that one little moment, that one little part. And it's what I call the glimpse. You gotta stare at it, and 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 soon, what happens is the physical form kind of, even though you could always seeing it, it 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 kind of fades away, and you and you're getting to look behind it, into that space, and you get a glimpse into the very personality or soul or spirit or energy or essence of of that moment, and 
And then you're having a conversation between the inspiration that you just had and the subject. And I always say the composition is really the, is the documentation of that conversation, right? So when you feel it and you look at your subject and you see the inspiration, you you know, subconsciously you're seeing this, the, the inspiration consciously you're seeing the subject. Then you start to have this conversation like, okay, what, what lines are present that's causing me to feel this way? Okay. If the lines are, are and then you might start to pick up, wow, there's all of these horizontals that are going on in here. Right. Or at least they're going in that direction. So now you begin to lay that out, you know, um, does that make any sense? It yes. does. Yeah. So, so basically my story can simply be interpreted as the emotion That's or the response I'm having it, to the subject. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a narrative, you know. Okay. That can be one aspect of it. And to be honest, um, if you get too narrative-y, it becomes too uh, what we call um, regional and one of the things we want to really try to do is, is create cosmopolitan work, work that's, it doesn't matter where you come from in the world, it, on a human level, it connects, it moves you, right? So it could be, you know, a grandmother with a, a granddaughter, right? But it doesn't have to be. It could be two trees, but still radiating the same exact energy. It could be a tree and a flower next to each other, right? You just feel the, the wisdom of one, the age of one versus the, the newness and, and the freshness of the other, right? Um, yeah. The way you bend them, now one is teaching the other, you know? If you bend them slightly different, they all, they're both gazing off into the same direction. It's a whole different story right? The story is that sensation. It's the, the energy, the animation, the transferring of ideas between two entities. And it doesn't matter if there are two cows in a field or two trees or two flowers or people, right? It, it really doesn't matter the form. You're really trying to capture the essence. Okay, that helps a lot. Thank you. Cool. Um, Deb, uh, what was it in the videos that you, that you watched um, that, that jumped out at you? Actually, it was the Maxfield Parish paintings. Uh -huh. And how successfully, I, I don't know the title of the one with the girl standing on the rock looking at into the ecstasy. The it. It's called the ecstasy. Um, ecstasy. Ecstasy. Yeah, and I was really intrigued with how much more successful that had more power than the Icarus one, but I understood what you were talking about with the Icarus piece. And, and I, it was a case of where, I guess what I have understood is kind of traditional sort of composition wasn't working, you know, I didn't see that applied to that. And so I was really fascinated with how successful a piece that was and, and it's a different way of thinking to get there. And so I'm, I'm still really intrigued with that. And, and I'm sorry, what was, that last, what was that last sentence? I was really intrigued oh, with intrigued that, by that, about how you approach a composition so differently and have something read so powerfully. Right, yeah. And, 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 and when you saw that and you, were, you, and you started thinking about your own work, what, what was happening in your imagination? Like, how, were, how was your mind trying to make that leap? Like, seeing your work and then... Well, I mostly paint water, but I also paint orchards. And I was thinking in terms of shapes and how those shapes would relate to each other. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really put like a human element into the water or cloud shapes, but I was just thinking of shapes and different arrangements and directions. And that's what I was getting from the video was how direction of shapes plays such a huge part in the composition. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, then we'll, 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 we'll come back to that then when looking at your, uh, your, um, your seascape there. Um, okay. let's, and Connie, um, what, 
what stood out for you in terms of like when you were looking through uh, these videos and your, and your work, I know you said the emotion, um, but when you think about your work, like again, like how, how is your imagination trying to take what you saw and apply it to what you do? I'm a slow thinker here. And you know, I apologize for asking very, very simple, simple, you know, <laughs> unstimulating questions, you know. It's just no, no, your question's fine. I just have to think about things for a long time before I answer. It's a contemplator. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was just particularly interested in the, in the Degas where you talked about, I know about the, the linear things about the Degas and the, and the just a straightforward design of the composition, but when you explained about he was really painting the movement of dance and that and the arc that you showed. I mean, and what that was just really interesting. I hadn't thought about composition in terms of creating an emotion or showing or that it shows an emotion or or the composition shows more of the story. Mm -hmm. I always thought about composition as simply a good design as in abstract terms. Yes. And I actually, I, what you're saying is what um, I think where Barb is as well. So um, I think I was looking at your work and I, I thought I saw in it, you know, the eye was moving and there was what we call an enclosure. Ah, she's on. Cool. Oh, you know what? I apologize. I got hey, into this hey, conversation. Hey. Oh, cool. Okay, there you are. There you are. <laughs> I knew if I ignored you long enough, you'd figure it out. How I did it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, we got into a conversation. I forgot to even check my email. Uh, so let me let me bring in your image here, uh, Kathy. Um, what were you guys talking about? What I miss? And I may be interrupted to let some um, a technician come in to look at our furnace. Okay. Uh, all right. So let me bring in your image. I was looking at somebody's Facebook, and they were so proud that they cleaned up their um, their studio. Who was that? <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> 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 oh, you know, I know who it was. That was a while back. Yeah, I think it was. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, two easels, files, beautiful. What's the problem? Because that's my nature, right? I, I, my personality type, I'll walk in and no matter how, it'll be a white room and a white wall and white floors. And I'm like, hmm, why is there a gray mark on that? <laughs> Oh, well, let me tell you, it didn't last that way very long. That was... <laughs> but I looked at it, and I was like, this is gorgeous. It's beautiful. And something in my mind was like, but there's, there's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. And, and then it clicked. There is absolutely no place in that studio to compose the work. So what I saw, like, I didn't see, like, a drafting table, right? I didn't oh, see... That was behind me. Oh, okay. Well, then that, that's, that makes total sense then. Okay. So, um, but it just kind of made me think like, hmm, you know, how many studios have one, but they're just basically like to hold stuff, right? Because a lot of I, artists, uh-huh. I sit on the floor a lot and draw. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. The floor and draw on the floor. Man, the image of that hurts my back for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, because a lot of artists that I deal with, uh, for some reason, they go from idea to painting, right? They do, and and, <laughs> and it's yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's like they want to jump in, you know, and, and, and they want to, you know, they start working it out and, and trying to figure it out. And, and, and they're making the art in the painting process. And, uh, and something that at the academy we, we, we try to stress is that the art is made in the composition and the execution of your plan is 
whatever your medium is, right? So when I was younger and I was studying design, we were always told if you can design, you can do anything. You just have to learn the tool. So if you want to go into graphic design or fashion design or architecture, all of those are mediums, they're tools, right, or painting. Um, but what's, what ties them all together is your ability to communicate your idea, what we call story, and then uh, and the actual communication is the design, right? So I'll tell you a quick story. When I was back in college, um, and maybe I already told you on that video, I don't know. Um, I was a second year illustration student. And I had a friend who was a first year architect student. And there was a design charrette, an, arch uh, an architectural design charrette. And, uh, and he wanted to know if I wanted to try it. So I was like, yeah, what the heck, man, let's do it, right? And uh, we had eight hours and we went up against all of the architects, all of, you know, master degrees, undergraduates, the interior designers and the industrial designers, all undergraduate and graduates. And so we went in there and we did, um, we had eight hours. So for the first two hours, we did the most important thing. We went and had lunch and uh, <laughs> like, let's go eat something, man. Right? And so we went and ate and people just thought, you know, these guys are insane. Like, you know, but we knew we shouldn't even start if we don't have an idea. Right. So let's go eat and have a good conversation and kingdoms are, are started on the back of, you know, napkins in bars, you know? So that's what we did. And we took our first two hours and we planned everything out. We got a great concept. We went back. Um, I designed everything out, communicated it out. And then he had uh, architectural experience. So he knew how to make blueprints, right? Um, in AutoCAD, so he took that and he basically did the blueprints, right, of, of the designs. And, um, and we won. Uh, we crushed it. And, and the school got so angry with us because this second-year illustration student and this first-year architect student won this design charrette. And the design charrette was to design these windows that were going in the churches um, and the, uh, in the church of the president of the school, right, like the church that he attended. So basically they were just trying to, you know, get free design work out of the students. But anyways, so, so we, we, we won and – they're like, uh, yeah, when you come to get your check, you have to come at 930 at night, you know, <laughs> and so we had to walk up and like, they never published it. They didn't tell anybody, you know, and because, uh, you know, it's just embarrassing. But it was one of those moments that just kind of confirmed what my teacher used to say to us, which was, if you can design, you can do it, you can do anything, right? Um, and, you know, he used to say, this is why Michelangelo and these great guys like were architects, they were sculptors, they were painters, they were inventors, you know, they were, they did all of this stuff because they weren't, Michelangelo loved sculpture, but he was a designer, you know, that's what they, that's what these guys were. And, um, and so that's, you know, uh, so, so that's why we say the art is made in, in the designing. It's, it's made in the composition, and then it's executed in your medium, which is kind of like, you know, the way you speak. You know, but the idea that you actually want to communicate um, has to come before you actually do the speaking. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So we're going to take a look at – oh, um, Kathy, I have to ask you this question now. Um, yeah. She just stepped out. I think she had to answer the door. <laughs> Did I guess I'm not going to ask her any questions. <laughs> let me uh, bring up, let me share my screen, and then we'll take a look at some artwork. That's uh, Deb Jenkins. I recognize yeah. that. <laughs> Wait, Deb Jenkins. Oh, okay. she's back. Um, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, you guys were probably the hardest group of people. Maybe I just didn't eat, eat right or something, but um, 
<laughs> you guys are making me stretch here, you know? Uh, because the work, the work on, on the um, initial uh, take is good. It's really, really good work, right? Um, and what I find is like there's really like five areas of composition, you know, there's like, we deal with line, we deal with space, we deal with value, we deal with story. Um, and uh, there's a fifth one, for some reason, is escaping me right now. Um, and, oh, that's right, we call it space, but we call it gridding. Um, and, uh, um, and usually what I find is that most people are really, really strong in like two of them, maybe three they're weak in others, right? And so um, from what I was looking at your work, we're going to look at where you're, where you're strong and then point out a weakness, okay, so that you can go back and begin to improve on it, all right? Um, Kathy, real quick, did you, did you get to watch any of the videos that I sent over yesterday? Yes. Oh, I like the way you said it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> did you watch them all or did you just watch one or like – I think I watched them all. Okay. So I sent over a feedback session with Donna when yeah. she was laying out the, the portrait. Yeah. What's really cool is like she's sharing all of that with her client. And last time we met, um, we basically talked about how, and I'm going, there's a, an artist out of Australia who's now moving into commission work as well. And so, um, I'm talking with both of them to develop the, this understanding that they're not selling paintings, right? They're, they're selling something that broadcasts in, in that person's home. Also, in, in Donna's case, because the, 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 the wife is the one who's hiring her, um, and she's working with a designer because they're remodeling the house or they just bought a house, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and as a designer now, she gets to have an amazing conversation with that, with that interior designer. What is, she can say to the designer, what is your story? What is your intent for this room? And now she can go and do what she does, but keeping those things in mind develop a painting that then supports what the interior designer is doing, right? And then she can have a conversation about, do you want to make the painting the, the centerpiece of the room? Or does the painting need to support the centerpiece, right? So it becomes a powerful piece of work, but it also becomes part of the whole. And when you start having that conversation with designers, that designer is going to bring you along to every house that they do <laughs> and try to sell your work to the, to the client. Um, so it's just another way of kind of developing that relationship with the, with those designers. I, I remember when I first stumbled upon this concept, um, I was doing some, I was analyzing some work, uh, these paintings that are in the rotunda down at, uh, in Washington. And I'm looking at this, this pattern in the design of all the paintings that were there. I'm like, hmm, that's weird. Why would they have the same pattern going on? And then I started analyzing the design of the architecture around, and what I realized was, duh, like they didn't create this rotunda and then be like, oh, let's hang paintings on the wall. You know, the architect actually designed with inside the, uh, inside the, the building spaces for paintings, right? And then laying out that geometry, the artist then could, could basically write a, 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 their own version of a poem in the idiom of the architect, right? So it was, it was paintings and things like that, but it, it connected, it harmonized with the whole piece, with the whole space. Um, and so again, as a designer, you're, you're kind of having a very different conversation with your client, with with uh, the interior designer or the architect, and you can begin to speak at, on that level with them and, and design something that helps, 
fulfill their vision, either the vision of the designer or the, or the vision of the client. Um, so it's just something cool. Um, so Kathy, when you watched the video, um, either of Donna or the video of um, the lecture, what stood out to you? What was like something that kind of jumped out and you're like, that's what I want. I mean, like, um, what did I, like, what did I learn? What did I? Well, I'm sure you learned a lot, but what was something that just was like, that resonated with you? Um, I think the idea of the design, the design and the storytelling aspect of it, um, I guess when I work out my painting ideas, I really don't think in that vein so much as telling the story with, I mean, I do in a way, you know, with line to the extent is of what you're talking about. Okay, cool, um, cool. And are you looking for in terms of story? Also, when I go outside to paint, I'm sorry, what was that? This is you your breaking up on me. Oh, I didn't know we were together. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, the, your, in terms of story, <clears throat> do you want to tell more of a narrative or do you want to um, evoke an emotion? I try to evoke the emotion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. So the fact that you're using the word try, you're not very confident that you're doing it. Exactly. Cool. In, in, in every case, in every case. I think though, lately I've been more and more aware of that without even realizing it. Beautiful. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So kind of open my eyes is to say, well, yeah, I kind of am starting to do that, but I didn't really have any words for it. Yep. You know, I didn't really yep. realize what I was doing other than I, I think I've been improving in that way. And even the storytelling, um, like with the painting that I submitted, I really wanted to tell that story, but I was, I was feeling I was failing in some aspect of telling that story. And I wasn't really sure how I was failing. I just know mm. I wasn't happy with it. So. Cool. Awesome. Well, let me go ahead and get uh, that image here. And then we'll take some, we'll look at some artwork here. So, and, and I have your permission to be uh, as honest as possible. Absolutely. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. What is the difference between telling a story or an emotion? Aren't they related? I think uh, telling a story ultimately is um, stimulating the brain. Uh, and sharing an emotion stimulates the heart, I think, at, at the end of the day. Okay. okay. <laughs> I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, are we on Deb or on Kathy? I, I'm just bringing it into this uh, into this file here. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is boom, 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 boom. Okay, all righty. So it's really blurry. Okay. I think since we have Kathy's up, we'll just start with Kathy. Um, oh, wait a second here. Uh, this is this is Deb's, right? Deb's. Okay, and then yes. this is Connie's. All right, so I got my names mixed up. It's only no. This is me. This is Deb's. Deb's. Yeah. Um, there we are. Okay, so this is uh, Deb. Actually, we're just gonna do it this way. This is Kate. Kathy. Kathy. And then this is wildflower. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there would be me. 
if you guys uh, stick around the academy, you're all going to get names at some point. So get ready. Think about what you say. <laughs> I'm sorry, it wouldn't be the there first time. Let me forewarn you. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's how I'm going to move that up there. This here. And um, blow this up. <clears throat> One of the first things I do, uh, especially if I get the sense that the person relies on color a lot, um, is I like to get rid of all the color, okay? And in doing that, you really get to see the design much, much clearer. Um, color is cool, but if your values are not right, then colors are relevant. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. So that's why we really, really focus on story, line, space, and then value. And to us, once you can tackle and master those four elements, then you have a blueprint, okay? Like you're the architect of the painting. And once you have those four elements in place, then you can take your architect hat off and put your contractor hat on and actually build according to the plan. And in this case, you're, all, you're four painters, so then your contracting hat would be the painting. Um, and by taking time and actually thinking through all these different aspects of the composition, when you, when you go to painting, the painting process becomes so quick because a lot of times you're trying to think about your values and you're trying to think about your movement and you're trying to think about the spacing and the pacing and the rhythm and the poetry and all of this stuff with a big glob of color on the front of a brush. And you're just juggling way too many things at one time. And so we walk through a process where you focus only on the story. And then when you have that, you move to the next stage. You only focus on the line work. And then when you have that, you focus on the spacing. And then when you have that, you work on the value. And what I like to picture it as is like when a baby's born and the head's soft, right? The bones are there, but it's just not awesome. I can't say the word. It doesn't go through the ossification process. Right. I mean, it, it is going through the ossification process, but the, the, the skull is not hard and it's not connected. Right. And the reason why is because humans are so darn intelligent in the size of our brains that if if that happened, like if the head actually was solid, we couldn't be born. Right? So and I only saying that because as as we're birthing a painting there has to be a softness in the design and the composition to get it on paper. And then what I like to see is line and space is how we form everything. And then when you bring value in, value, what value does, it gets rid of your lines and it replaces it with edges. And it gets rid of your spaces and replaces it with values, like tones. Right, so now this idea that you had in the story section, now you're starting to form it with line and space and now it becomes like real when you add value to it. It becomes like a rock, like solid. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's, at least that's how I look at it, it's like, we're birthing something from this, from the invisible into the visible. And um, so when we look at this image here, uh, Kathy, um, since your concern was about story, okay, I'll bring back your original. Um, what is the story? What is it that you're trying to communicate? What is it that you want people to feel or know or experience when looking at this work? Well, for one thing, I think that the values in that picture that you're looking at are way too light. Well, not hold on, hold on, hold on. 
That right, wasn't the why, Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because it makes a difference. Hold on, story. hold on. That wasn't the question. Okay, well, I'm just explaining. I got my story. My story is the moonlight. Okay, that's my story. I want people to know to realize that there's the moonlight kind of feeling. So the moon is rising and the sun is behind me shining a warm glow onto the buildings and onto the overall scene. And so the scene itself is a, is a very well-known farm up, up north. So, but the moonlight was, was my initial story or mood that I wanted to show. Okay. okay. The, the I think story. that is an amazing story. Okay. The fact that what you're trying to capture is that, is, is that transition between the moon coming up, you know, hope coming up and the sun going down, correct? That, that transition. Okay. That is a, a, a cosmopolitan, global, universal experience. You can imagine someone buying that from all around the world, right? I mean, because they can relate to it, right? They can get it. They can, oh, okay. Now, they, now, in terms of taste, meaning maybe they like your style, maybe they don't like your style, maybe they don't like farms, right? That's, that's fair enough. But they can appreciate the concept, right? Because they, they get it. Now, what they'll, almost no one will ever understand, except for those 100 people that maybe live in that area, is the fact that that is actually a real farm that you know, and this is something that actually happens. And so um, this is why, like... Could be. Yeah, go on. Hello? Oh, yeah, it could be. It, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say that's true. Um, the area where this is, though, is a well-known area up in a certain part of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really want to rearrange the buildings too much. I mean, I did rearrange them a little, but I didn't want to, like, change it so much that it would not be recognizable in that respect. Oh, I so wouldn't change the buildings. Make the buildings look exactly like the buildings that are there. That was kind of my dilemma. I mean, it just felt so kind of um, off balance. So I added the road in there. But now that I think maybe the road has to be moved over a little, little bit so it's more balanced. Okay. That makes sense. Um, all, all of those things make sense. None of those things have anything to do with your story. Does okay. that make sense? Not really. Okay. So you're saying that uh, having the road – moving the road over, moving the houses over, whatever it is, will give balance to the painting, correct? Correct. What does that have to do? I'm not saying you're wrong. Like, okay, it has to have balance, right, to be a good design. But every decision you make has to support the purpose of the painting, okay? So if, if I if, – you know, let's say you give birth to a son, okay? Are you going to name your son? What, do you have a son? <laughs> two, okay? So let's say you give birth to two sons. What's your, what's, what's your first son's name? John. John. So are you going to call your son John or Jane? John. Well, I, I, of, of course, right? right? Why? Because it supports who he is, Right. If John was a girl, you would name him Jane, right? Right. Right? Because it supports who he is. So you're going to go out and you're going to buy some clothes for John, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you see a, a beautiful little tutu and some dresses. Are you going to walk <laughs> by them or are you going to buy them? I know these are very s deep questions. <laughs> yeah. There's, it's obvious, but that's my point. If John is the story, then every decision you make has to support who John is. So if the story is about the trans of the, you know, this, um, uh, this movement from the moon to the sun back to the moon, then every decision in your painting has to support the story. 
Does that make sense? Yes. So, for example, if if we're thinking moon, sun, because the moon is rising and the sun is going down, okay? And we want to feel this movement, okay? Mm -hmm. You can begin to feel that in those three little curves, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what this image is, oops, how rude. Okay, is this. Does that feel, radiate anything like your story? Which one, autom which one feels closer to what it is that you really wanted to communicate? This or that? Which one's John and which one's Jane? I actually like the, the lines kind of in a way because of the horizontal lines it just gives me a feeling of it's like peacefulness now I do, the triangle at the top doesn't seem to work but I, I for some reason I really like those horizontal lines I'm sorry. I, I, I agree with you I think to, to finish this off better you probably would want to put a nice horizontal in there right um, and maybe even Oops. Hmm. Okay. There we are. Maybe something like this. Okay. Is that, now this is kind of starting to have that feel, right? Um, th this is what we would call like an energy map. You're kind of just gesturing out the movement, the animation of the piece mm -hmm. before you really start thinking about, well, what is the... Um, Come on. What, 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 you know, what do the trees look like? What does the sky look like? You know, those types of things. So before you even start thinking about the nouns in the piece, you want to figure out what's the overall energy of the piece, okay? Um, in this case, we'll do it like that. So this would be the John. This is totally Jane, okay? Does that make sense? See, now if, you, if, you, if, you, if this is John, then we can go back in and say, okay, well, um, so now we can put maybe the, the farm there, the farmhouse there, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we want to keep this, this feel of the, of the sun coming down, right, we need to move the eye down. So well, now that makes sense to have the, the mountain or the hill or the tree you know, coming up in this direction, okay? Because now the, it's, it's helping move the eye down. If you want to move the eye up over here, well, then you might put a cloud like you have it, okay? But now the cloud is strategically designed to help move the eye upward, okay? So that way, as you're starting to put your nouns in there, they, they're dictated by the, the energy or the verb the movement, the animation that you want to convey because the nouns are never going to be what people relate to or what they feel. It's the animation of the piece that, that, that if you want to move people, you got to literally move them. So what I, what, what I want you guys to do is a little test, okay? Um, I want you to, with your eyes, I want you to trace this rectangle with your eyes, but when you trace it with your eyes, I want you to actually physically move your physical head, okay, as you do it. And do it a couple times. Okay, and then I'm gonna give you another shape here. Now, a circle fits inside of a square perfectly, but now do the same thing. Trace it with your eyes, but move your head with your eyes. Do you feel 
the difference. Yes. So when you move someone's eyes, they're feeling something different. And that's the name of the game. If you want to know what they feel, you've got to figure out how do you translate what it is that you want them to feel, how do you translate that into an eye movement? If I feel shame, am I going to look up to the right, to the left, or down? Down. Down. Yeah. And we all agree on that. It's universal. Boom, we agree. Now, now we can even go deeper. Are you going to look straight down to the left or to the right? To the right. I would agree. When you, when you look to the left, it doesn't feel right. But looking down into the right, for some reason, that feels right. Would you all agree on that, or, or, or did you have a different experience? I had a different experience, looking left. Because you're left-handed? Are you left-handed? No, I'm right-handed. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. There's always going to be a weirdo in a group. It would be Deb, yep. So we're not looking... <laughs> He's got my number. <laughs> so, something at the academy we always talk about is we never seek perfection. Okay? We seek greatness. Greatness is achievable. Perfection, it doesn't exist in this realm. Okay? It, it, it's what we call the realm of the light and the realm of the rainbow. In the realm of the rainbow, you've got to deal with constraints, what people call reality, you know? And, the, and, and, you know, you're going to have reds and blues and greens, and all of them are beautiful, and they all need to be respected, but you've got to make a decision. And so uh, da Vinci, uh, da Vinci uh, Vincent van Gogh, in essence, said, you can't exist on the North Pole and the equator at the same time, so pick a line. <laughs> For me, my line is color. <laughs> okay? Because he was dealing with the realm of the rainbow. Perfection exists in the realm of the light. And we have to always remember where we are. Because we, we, we deal with both. Okay? We're, we're immortal beings trapped in time. And it becomes a frustration, right? We're eternal and yet we're <laughs> trapped in time. So we seek perfection and yet it doesn't exist in the, in the, in the realm that we live in. So... All of that to say is that we're not seeking perfection, we're seeking greatness. And one rule of, of, of um, one little principle that you can apply is, if you get it 80% of what you want, that's perfection, <laughs> okay? Um, and so if the majority of the people who, who look at your work get it, they're feeling it, if most of us look down to the right, and that's what triggers shame in us like that feeling of shame um and that's great if there's someone who who looks to the left that's cool too both are right um but what we what we're trying to strive is is what they call aspective um design or aspective drawing it's it's that uh here i'll show you an example of it <clears throat> so when you think of egyptians the egyptian will say which Well, that's a horrible nose. Sorry, Egyptian people. Okay, which one reads quicker, faster, and more accurately as a face? <clears throat> the profile or the front view? Yeah. Sorry about that chin, too. Profile. Profile. Oh, what happened? Okay, here we are. Yeah, the profile, right? <clears throat> now, in terms of an eye... If I put an eye in here, which reads as an eye easier, quicker? The front. The front view. Yeah. And so the Egyptians say, let's get rid of this. Let's put that. And now you have an Egyptian drawing. Okay. Very intelligent. 
because they were trying to draw as aspectively the best view of every aspect of the body. That's why they had two right feet. It wasn't that they were dumb. Hmm. It, was, uh, it was the aspect of their culture. They wanted the best view of everything. Hmm. Kind of cool, right? Yeah. So when, when designing, remember, the idea of the artist stuck in their studio painting what they feel for themselves is a joke. I mean, it's really ridiculous and insulting because you've been given a talent to share with the world. It's your mission. It's your, your anointing. It's your whatever you want to call it. It's your gift. And this idea of, <clears throat> for the last three, four generations of artists to tell us to, you know, screw the public, only care about you, it, it, it's almost devilish in my opinion. And so we want to care about people. And so we need to know how do humans think? How do we trigger in their minds, in their soul, in their heart, the, the ideas that we want to convey, okay? So back to here, this is going to convey something, but it's not going to convey the idea that you're really trying to, to um, communicate. And in essence, you were trying to do that. You did put the sun over here, okay? So intuitively, you're saying, okay, the sun needs to come here. The light needs to come down here, okay? Let me, let me block this out here. Okay, uh, I thought this was the sun up here, to be honest. But if that's the moon, you know, um, you're, you're kind of doing it. But what happens is then this line comes in and, and cuts it. Does that make sense? That doesn't, that doesn't add to that flow. This, your eye comes straight across. So everything now is being thrown over here. What's not happening is, is the experience that you want, which is to have the person ascending and descending and ascending and descending. And this constant flow of night and day and night and day, right? And so what we could do is take this here, And, and, and add a value. Do you see how all of a sudden now your eye is starting to shift up? Yes. Boom. Because now we're getting clear on our story. So here we can come in with a, sh a shadow over here. Well, you see how it came down on the bottom. That doesn't really help the story. So we want to shift the eye. Now this becomes really nice. You can put a little dark there and that little curve that's on that building now your eye is moving do you feel the difference just in that mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah you're starting to maybe bring a, a shadow in here again that shifts you up now on this side of the house <clears throat> you know this is a little too too heavy i think but and these are the nuances you could go back in and with a couple little glazes start to, you know, that, that road now is irrelevant. You could keep the road in there, not in there. It doesn't matter. Right. How about the design of the clouds? Like if, if the clouds came down mm -hmm. to create that circle, would that add to it? Yep. Let's, or let's take a look at it. Part of uh, let me see if I can come down here. So maybe we come up through here. Oh. And that also adds this beautiful little space in here, right? Also, what you're doing is making this darker. Right, so now people are reading it as nighttime. In reality, or, it is darker. This is just a bad photo. Of my okay. Mind. It's terrible. Um, 
and then I mean, do you see how that's now lifting you up into the sky? So now how do we bring you back down here? Uh, maybe what we can do is lighten this a little bit. Let me, let me lay it over top like this. And then, let me do this soft light. Okay. So by, yeah, probably I'm going to do that. Maybe lightening this area over here. And so this is where you get to play with values. See, now maybe even bringing a little warmth in there or something. So you can see, I mean, let's go ahead and show you before and after here. Mm -hmm. um, see how your eye is being shot off the side and it's really about the tree line maybe the landscape. Mm -hmm. Now this, that is something every time you look at it, your eyes moving through this thing and it's, it's telling the story a lot differently. And we didn't really change any of the structure. We just shortened the cloud and, and, and shifted around some values. A very, very different. Um, Now what's interesting is Hi, I know. So to, uh, a fairly minor changes. Yeah, and it totally changed the feeling of mm -hmm. the thing. Um, let me see here. Oopsie. Okay, so what I want to do is duplicate that. Okay, so there is the, the value. This is the original value, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we're for just looking at the value changes. Mm -hmm. There's that that's change. Difference. That's that that space is alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big change. With yeah, it's a big change. Subtle value changes created a big change in the piece. So now the question then is, if the subtlety can improve it. How often are the subtleties ruining it? Mm -hmm. Good point. Right. I mean, yeah. really like cooking, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're cooking, you're putting all this stuff in, you spend all this time, and it's great, and then you, you know, you go to take that salt and you grab a little bit of it and you throw it in, and you're like, yes! And then you serve it, and it tastes like a donut because you grab sugar instead of salt, right? <laughs> it's just... A little change. <laughs> that could not be, that, that's, it would be better if you grab sugar than salt, because sometimes if you go the other way and you bite into a donut and it's salty, then it's like, ah, oh, what the heck? <laughs> and, and another thing, Victor, that I am noticing by the changes that you made um, is that you have um, actually invited me into that farm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I feel as if it's kind of nestled in there, and I want to just go in and visit it. Whereas before, and I think this was because of all of those, uh, the, the, how linear, how horizontal everything was, you didn't get that sense of that little farm being kind of nestled in there and, and wanting mm -hmm. to go in and, and kind of visit it. Yep. This is the difference between selling it and people saying, well, that's a nice painting. Good little artist. And then leaving. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sucks. Like you put it together a show and you, you put the money into the framing, not, not, you know, all the time into the painting, the materials, the time, the travel, everything to put up a show. And then like nothing sells. Right. <laughs> and, and that's discouraging. That's discouraging. Um, 
I told you the story about Michelle. What, what, for me, what was profound about that is that the people were there with cash. I mean, they were there, obviously they bought. They bought three of her paintings. So it wasn't that they didn't have the money. They just, they liked the other work, but it didn't resonate with them. And it's very possible, <laughs> I didn't even think about this. It's very possible that those people who went there would have bought the other people's paintings if her work was not standing next to it. Does that make sense? Like, because in a sea of glazed donuts, they all look good. I think I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> But then when you have that, you know, that Boston, you know, eclair or whatever it is, that Boston cream over there on the side or whatever, it just stands out, you know, and it makes everything else just look like glazed donuts, right? Um, it's like wine bottles, you know, if they're all in the same wine bottle. And then you got this beautiful little curvy, you know, South African wine or whatever. It's just like, whoa, what's that? You know, that's cool. So this is, I mean, these are the little things. I remember uh, when I was back in college, um, I started teaching my professor this stuff. And, um, and then his job, because at the college in the summer, they would do these, um, where they bring teachers from all around the country and they would like, you know, teach them things. So he said, you can't tell nobody, but I'm going to let you teach the class, right? So I got to teach these teachers. Um, and at the end of the week, all the teachers had this gallery show and they all put up their work. And the thing we kept hearing over and over and over and over again was, I don't know what about, what it is about your work and the work that came out of that class, but wow, you know, they, people can't articulate it, but they can feel it. And my job and my joy is to teach people how to articulate it and do it and then articulate in such a way that when you have a conversation with that potential, you know, potential buyer or, or just the person who's enjoying the work, you can, you can teach them how to actually speak about the work. You know, there are three, re I think it's three reasons why people buy artwork, pride, um, profit, you know, it's like an investment. Uh, and pleasure. Oh, I just love it. Right. But the pride one is interesting because that's, that's like where the guy who, and I've heard stories about this where, you know, a guy goes out and he buys a boat and it's like a 52 incher. Right. And his friend goes out and buys the 52 incher, you know, <laughs> because he just has to be better than his friend. Right. Um, or the people buy something when they know the story behind it, their friends come over and they're like, Oh, well, <laughs> let me tell you the story behind this painting or whatever it is. And, and knowing, knowing that we design images that give pleasure. We design images that increase in value because when you can show that the masters design this way and you're designing this way, well, then that sets the stage, right? People can see that and say, oh, man, this thing's going to grow. It's going to increase. And then when you show them that, now you're giving them the story to be able to tell their friends. So it's just not like, oh, look at this pretty painting. It's like, no, nah, you know, the painting here, you know, the moon is coming up and the sun is coming down. And every time I walk in the room, I just feel it going around and around and around. And, yes, I just made a little rhyme and a little nursery song out of that. But um, so – Kathy, that's a great painting. A couple of little nuances, you know, just change a couple of your little values with a couple of glazes. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to have yourself a nice, a really nice, nice piece. Cool? Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what you could do, depending on how big it is, you put a big piece of tracing paper over it and just kind of play around how you want that, how you want the eye to move. Okay? That's a good idea. All right, let's go to Deborah. Deborah, I like your use of warm and and cool temperatures. Um, 
want to show you, it gives a beautiful effect, right? But when you get rid of them, it's just a value conversation that you're really having, right? Right. So, now, if we were going to do a range of value, where really is the white, white, and the, and the black, black? Not that you want to use black and not that you want to use white, but I'm just using the extremes. Like, if we, this is called carrying power, okay? If I walk into a gallery and I see that painting across the room, it's going to be probably about that size, right? I mean, maybe a little bit bigger. <clears throat> So your image has to be able to read in terms of value and design from across the room. And then as you walk up to it, so on that macro level, it has to communicate your story, your vision, your, your energy. Then as you get closer, then <clears throat> the design on the micro level needs to support it. Right, so you're, you're as you're walking up towards it, you're bringing it more into focus, but it has to work from that little thumbnail section. Okay. Um, I like the shape of your canvas. The question a format I like to use quite a lot. I like mm -hmm. long narrow paintings and. So I'm gonna give you a little trick then, okay? Okay. Um, I'm just debating if I wanna unlock the secrets. I will. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. okay. Be terribly honest. <laughs> um, when you do these long ones, you got to be careful because the eye will actually, if I ask you ladies to jump, um, are you all able to do so? Yeah. I don't, okay, I don't want to hurt anybody in this little exercise. So before I, before I get into this, I want you guys to all, all stand up and throw something on the floor. Um, Whatever it is, just throw something on the floor. And I gotta, I gotta watch you all do this. This is kind of fun. I'm glad we have this on camera. Um, <clears throat> now, throw it on the floor. Uh, Kathy, I wouldn't throw it that far. <laughs> Unless you're like a super jumper. Okay. Now, I want you from where you are to jump onto that object that you just threw on the floor. Before I threw it. Okay. It's not going to be a pencil. <laughs> I can't believe you're all jumping. It's like a bunch of bunnies. All right. Now, now okay. come on back. Bunnies in the garden. That really had nothing to do with this you video, just, did it? You, you just wanted us to stand up and stretched but yeah, yeah, that's what my legs <clears throat> suddenly a lot longer than the other one <laughs> as a composer you find things um that speak composition all the time that exercise stemmed from i remember i i, I don't know how old i was maybe about 16 15 years old and i was watching squirrels jump from trees to trees and i was like oh my god like I wish I could do that. Like, how, how do they do that, right? And, you know, it was this idea like humans are supposed to be super smart and, you know, but on an instinctive level, they know how to do that. And then as I got older, I started thinking about that kind of concept and thinking about how amazing our brain is that it can calculate the amount of effort, energy, the, the contractions of the, of the muscles, like all of that information has to occur because if too much energy, you, you go past it. Not enough, you fall short, right? The wrong, if you go to jump and your arms go out and your legs don't move, well, then you just fall forward, right? <laughs> like there's all of these calculations that occur 
And all we experienced was be you know, a little fun jump. But on a mathematical physics level, you could write a, an entire book on the hop, right? I mean, if you really, really sit down and think about it. Mm-hmm. So understanding that when we look at a work of art, how our brain is calculating all kinds of things, proportions, ratios, there's all kinds of calculations that are going on. So when you, so I'm going to teach you a little secret. If you want to figure out how to place things where the mind already is calculating those alignments to be, and if they don't land on them, then the mind feels something's incomplete, something's off. Okay. Um, now I don't have the science to back up what I just said. In 500 years, I'll figure it out and articulate it. I just know it works. Okay. Uh, and the science might actually be there, but I'm not a math guy, so I have to translate all the math into spatial thinking. So that's what we're going to do. So here, what, what you're going to see is if you're going to work on a long format like this, okay, you will want to find, uh, let me do it this way. Let me um, draw a rectangle. Boom. That's way too fat. All right, so let's go down to 20. Okay, there we are. And then, so you're going to draw a box, and then in each box there's two lines that go across. And you probably saw this in the video, right? Yeah. Um, the Baroque and the Sinister, okay? Right. So then what you want to do is take this mother rectangle and um, – that's actually one of our sayings at the academy. You're one bad mother rectangle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm one bad mother rectangle. All right, cool. <laughs> and these are called your daughters, all right? So when you're designing out your story, let's say this little wave configuration here, one of the places that you could place it on is somewhere right where this this meets, okay? Um, where the main, in this case, the main Baroque angle comes in alignment um, with this this edge, okay? So you can place things there. You can place things on this point if you wish, okay? This is actually, um, oops. This is a very powerful place to place it because now it's in direct relationship. So what I mean by that is you have the length of this Baroque, which is in direct relationship to the length of this sinister. Okay. Just that one is um, on a, on a um, landscape orientation. The other one is a portrait orientation. Okay. The fact oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Then, because we scaled it down, so now the height of the portrait is equal to the height of the landscape, now they have another relationship, okay? So your mind already is calculating, it's flipping things, it's twisting things, it's, it's calculating all of these things. The other thing that it's going to calculate is your square, Okay, so whatever the, the height of that rectangle is, it's going to calculate. Um, hmm. No, oh, I'm just using the eraser tool. Oh, silly. So now we have what we call a rebated square. Okay, so that, reba- so that square comes in from the edge. All right. So now when you're trying to figure out where you're going to place this, this key horizontal, okay, Let's go ahead. Oopsie. What did I just do? Okay. Hmm. Oh, I got you. That's, that's the problem. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to take this. I don't want to take your cloud formation. Just, oops, just this part here. All right, so here is your image, okay? 
what we can do is shift this down, just, just a slight shift to where this line comes, mm -hmm. okay? And now we have a very, very different, different feel. So your mind already calculates that space, but, we have, but you have to learn how to find it by drawing a box with two lines and then flipping that box. Okay. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so now we, now we have a, a, a ratio that's here to here, okay, which is directly in relationship to the rate, to, uh -huh. to the math of the whole, okay, to the relationship of this. Okay. Okay, so all of this stuff is starting to um, mm -hmm. harmonize and, uh, and unify to itself. Again, if you, fig if you wanna do the physics and the math of it, you can, but we're just going to deal with space, okay? Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and see if that's the new image. Oh. Okay, this is kind of feeling, it's not in the center, so you, you didn't make that mistake, right? You brought it down. Um, right. One more option. You can see how there, it, it just lifts up the sky. I mean, this thing really, really pops nice. Mm -hmm. um, it it kind of makes us feel like we're actually in, in, that, in that water now, which is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. Now, you could always go the other way, too. You can, you can move it up um, if you wanted to. Uh, let's bring these little things back here, our little armature. Um, so just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and um, bring this back in here, this little... Little thing in the jiggy. Mm -hmm. All right, so all right. So then, so if I was going to move this up, that would be halfway, which we would never want to do, right? Right. But we could move it up and just nudge it down right about there. Okay. And what's nice about that um, is if this was your, 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 uh, where am I? Okay. This was your sand or your beach, right? That would give you a really, really beautiful um, division of space. See? What's striking me from what I'm looking at is there's an equalization of sky, water, and sand. I'm kind of seeing three parallels. Mm-hmm. Let me bring this down here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So when I, when I look at this, I feel exactly what you feel, like, ugh, no way, right? But what I'm showing you is that by right. laying so, out so, – what happened there? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, hold on, something's uh, self oh, I, I guess. Okay. I'm sorry, say that again? I was just starting to say I saw three parallels there. Um, that's compositionally for me wouldn't work to have that evenness mm -hmm. of sky, water, and sand. Mm -hmm. You're saying you don't like that? I don't care for it, no. Yeah, me either. <laughs> you know, and, and this is one of the problems. Um, see, when you have an armature – like a tool, it could be value, it could be an armature to help you design space, right? Um, if you have no story, then you're just trying to use your, your tools to, to, to make art happen, right? And it gives you all of these right. options, 
all of these varieties. And then you're just trying to, ooh, what's pleasing? What's nice? That's why we always have to start with story. What is the why of the piece? What is the intention? And then all those things begin, you know, now, now we can use, use the tools to, to achieve the ends. So do you want to take a moment and, okay. and share with us? Let's go back to your original. What is your story? What was it that you were trying to, to share? Um, this terrific storm had just gone through and, and I was standing there being hit by hail and suddenly it was moving through so quickly, the sky just turned orange and this, this is what it looked like. Um, and I was just so taken with how it looked and saw how huge it was. That's what I was trying to convey, but I, compositionally, it, it's not working for me, but I don't really know where to go with how to make that sky so everything you spent like in that in that in that story, right? The sky turned colors, and the sky was hailing, and the sky was just big and expansive. And yet, you yes. almost, you almost share the same amount of real estate that the sky has with with the water and the and the and the beach. Um, yes, that's why I think the original, no, the one I did first here. Let me see. So you lowered the horizon. Boom. Exactly. Yep. Made that work better. Yeah. And now, knowing your story, mm -hmm. we could probably even push it a little further. So let's let's bring this down and get rid of the beach because the beach really isn't important, right? Uh, in this, right. So we could actually even bring it down further. Let's do this. Oops. Um, okay, so why don't we do this? And what's interesting is by creating this, um, let me not do it that way. How do I want to do this? This is how I want to do it. There we are. Okay. Cool. Now we're feeling the energy and the importance of that sky, right? Yeah. Now the part that bothers me too is is the cloud that makes that, you know, the big cloud, the deeper mm -hmm. value piece. I think that it could be a better design, but I really don't know what to do with that to help with the story. Um, well, what you're trying to do is to, to, to kind of move the eye in this, wow, look how big the sky is. Right? Right. And I feel like what I did was kind of shoot you off to the right. Well, you, you did, but it doesn't take too much to fix it. Okay. Um, let me find a painting okay. uh, so I can show you how, how the masters have done it. Uh, okay. Caravaggio. Let me find um, Caravaggio. There we are. And I want the Last Supper. Oh, sorry. Talking about food again. Um, okay. <laughs> view this all right so here we is as they would say um, at this little Caravaggio piece well it's not little but um, the unique thing about this design um, is We see one figure, two figure, three figure, four figure, and then there's this open space, okay? And yeah. the reason why is because you're, they're trying to invite you in for you to kind of pull up your seat and sit at that table with them, okay? okay. Um, you have to understand that in the Baroque time, one of the purposes of the Baroque painting versus the Renaissance painting, the Renaissance were really like, 
hey, look at all the wealthy people. Let's celebrate the people who have access and are closed, you know, off to humanity, right? Uh -huh. The Baroque uh, changed that. So during the Baroque, you have the, the, the Protestant Reformation going on. You have the invention of the printing press, which takes knowledge and gets it out to everybody. Music changes. Um, and one of the things with the art that changes is this idea that uh, let's create art that invites people into this divine relationship with, with God versus, well, only the rich people have relationship with God type of thing that was going on before then. Okay. okay. So one of, one of the techniques that you use is this. Okay. So they have this curve that's coming through here. And the reason why is because if you, if you, if you walk into a gallery, okay, and here's your floor, here, here is Mr. Stick Figure, okay. <laughs> wow, sure what an artist. <laughs> and, and here is this, this painting on the wall, okay, so when, when we're looking at it, here's the table, here are the guys sitting, okay. Here's Jesus. Okay. So what's happening is you have this curve that's actually coming out of the image. So there's actually a point where as you move closer, an alignment occurs where you realize, oh my God, I'm in the painting. You step one step back, you're out of it. The alignment's off. Okay. okay. So if I go here and here, that's an alignment. If I go here and I just shift it, one nugget to the side is a misalignment, right? It's that close. Uh -huh. Boom. In Savannah, Georgia, where I went to school, there was a place where you go down on River Street, and if you stood directly in the center of this little square and you spoke, you would be surrounded by your own voice. It was an echo. <laughs> you take one step to the side and you would just talk normal. It was weird, it was cool, it was creepy. It was intentionally designed for that. In Guatemala, okay. uh, in Guatemala, they have these temples, right? These uh, pyramids. And the story is that one of the kings, the Guatemalan kings, the Mayan kings, I mean, um, he had this bird called a catal. I think it's called a catal, right? And it has these big, beautiful feathers on its tail. And it would fly with him everywhere. And so it became like this mystical bird to the Guatemalans and to the Mayans. And there is a temple called the Katal. And what you do is you stand there and you clap your hands. And the vibration of your hands go out and hits the temple at such an angle that the sound radiates back. And somehow they figured out to actually create the sound of the Katal, right? You actually hear the bird. Like when you clap your hands and it hits the temple, the oh sound gosh. of the bird shoots back at you, right? So alignments, I mean... The math that's required for that is insane. So this is what happens when, when someone walks in here, there's math that's going on. So out here, you don't feel it. You, you step forward, you feel it. Okay. Um, okay. So that, when I saw this image, I like this because that's what I saw here. You have this, this shape going on. Okay. So now the, you got to be careful okay. because, you, you, you do got to be careful that your eye is, uh, doesn't get shot off here. Um, and what, what I mean by shot off is this would be wrong. Okay, let me, let me, let me show you if, if, if this went like this. Okay, if it shot off yeah. horizontally, then you're screwed, right? Although in, in, some right. Weird, in some weird way, that actually kind of is nice because it really feels much, much longer, right? Um, so let's let's look at the let, let's look at the difference. Uh, yeah, I mean that that already feels longer and bigger just by having the eye kind of move more horizontally like that. But now you have a problem, and the problem is that your eye is shooting off the edge of the image. So one thing that you can do. Um, is figure out what curve do you need to have this? Oops. Um, 
do you need to have this at, you know, how, 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 how deep does that curve have to be? Okay. Maybe it needs to come up here. Um, you know, so you gotta, you gotta kind of <clears throat> play or play around with that. And what I'm trying to do is figure out a curve. Ooh, I think we hit it. Um, that goes out that extends your eye out past you as you're standing there so now you feel that the sky is now over you do you you, you see that Fancy. Mm -hmm. i'm sorry ladies what was that yes he said yeah. it feels more expansive yes yes is the line continuing off or oh yeah, yeah you're, gonna, you're gonna continue off but it has to be done in such a way because what's gonna happen is when your eye sees a curve we call it an enclosure it's going to complete it so you want okay. a curve that's closer to a horizontal but it's still a curve the horizontal is going to make you go forever to the right and to the left so you need to bend it just a little bit so that your eye actually completes it but when it's looking at it it's feeling like oh my God, the sky is really coming around me, right? That's making sense. Okay. Now, you contrast that with the ocean that goes straight across because your story wasn't about that the ocean felt big. No, it was about the sky. It was about the sky feeling big. So what you could do is actually lower your values um, on, on the side of your ocean, um, Let's actually probably make it a little darker, uh, something like that, maybe. Uh, I was thinking darker. No, that's probably too much. But, yeah, there we are. Okay, bring that in. It's called a vignette. They vignette those edges. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, look at that. Okay, so now when we're looking at the water, our eye is focused more on the action in the center, but our eye picks up this movement in the sky that just goes off the page and around us and encompass, encompasses us, right? Right. And now we're starting to feel that sky that you wanted people to feel because it wasn't the sky, it wasn't the water, it wasn't the the the... the the, the land, what you're trying to capture is that moment, that sensation that you were feeling. Yes. But you also want to keep it in, in context to where you were. Right. But the reality is it doesn't matter if it's that location or another location. Nobody knows. What, what matters is do they feel what you felt when you were in that moment? Right. Okay. So Thomas. Correct. Called, I'm sorry. What was that? I said that's correct. That was, I wanted the feeling. It wasn't about that location. Yep. And so now, now, you know, I always encourage people, like, especially if they're, if they kind of work directly on Canvas, just to take, you know, just, just give yourself one day where you're going to not allow yourself to think about paint. Um, and, and I'm not telling you to draw, right? I'm not, I don't want you to draw necessarily. I want you to design. I want you to think about the composition, the design. How are you going to communicate this feeling, this sensation, which we call story, okay? How are you, gonna, how are you going to trigger that in your viewer? And the okay. only two things you really have are, are line and space to actually do that. Okay. Because when you put a brush mark... Uh, down on a canvas. Um, I did it again. Okay. When you put that brush mark, okay, what you're really looking at is it has a value. It has a, a measurement of space, right? We could actually call it a notional space. And it also creates a line, like where it begins and where it ends and the edges all of that 
again, it's just lying in space. And then okay. ultimately a value, it's either going to be dark or light. Okay. Mm -hmm. So using line and space here, let me give you another example of, of how that works. You see all of this space? It's just yeah. openness. But if right. I put if I put a line there, boom, it changes it. Now we yeah. have a top and a bottom and a left and a right. If I okay. put a, an, another line next, and so now we have two lines, and now we have something in the center, right? We have this okay. area which goes up a little bit, so this feels like he's floating or flying or moving up. He's ascending. All of these emotions and uh, cognitive triggers are happening in us, and all we did was put two marks on a piece of paper. Hmm. Now, what if we take that, and I knew that was going to happen, um, and we move it here. Same line, totally different of feeling. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and most artists, when I say most, I'll be generous and say 99.9%. Um, <laughs> was that you, Wildflower? <laughs> I'm just thinking on that point, 1%. <laughs> <laughs> They're not thinking at this level. And you're seeing that this is where the power happens. This is why Norman Rockwell said, before I even think about color or texture, my drawing and my design have to be perfect. And then okay. after I sat down and talked with him and said, perfection doesn't exist in this realm, that only greatness, then he said, before I think of line, uh, color and texture, my drawing and my design have to be great. No, I'm just joking. But... Um, <laughs> And that's why we call him the great Norman Rockwell. So th this is where we have to be. Um, the problem is, is when people start doing this, they think, oh, I got to draw. And if I'm going to draw, I have to make it look like the thing and I have to render and I have to, you don't even do value in this stage. Once you bring value, that's a whole nother layer of thinking. And it has all of its own nuances and problems that you got to solve. You know, all you're managing is a bunch of lines that at some point when you add value are going to turn into edges. Right. So you can see how all of these, like this edge here. Um, okay, let's go here. Like this, this, this edge here, this edge here. These are shooting you off here and then shooting you over here. All of these things are shooting you off mm -hmm. here. Okay. And, and that's fine. Okay. If, you know, if, if, if it's intentional and it, and it supports the story. Okay. So I think being that it was a stormy day, right. You don't want mm -hmm. to have just one, um, Let's see where I can, where's that, where's all those white lines coming from? There we are. Um, okay. So why don't we do this? I'll multiply this layer, bring this down. Okay. So we're going to use that line. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust your painting to that line. And, um, and then if I was painting, the, uh, you know, designing this painting, I would probably use a minimum of two, maybe three directions, okay? And the reason why is because I would want to show the chaos of the moment, okay? Right now, we're just looking at a beautiful, expansive uh, sky. Um, and so what we probably would re really want to do is come in here and begin to twist this up. Okay. So now, and maybe on this one, we get rid of that. Okay, so now you're starting to feel these three lines into two lines. There's a tension that's going on over here, right? Uh-huh. But again, your eye is going out of the paint and it's coming back in. Okay. Um, 
And then, so let's go ahead and start bringing in, what we're doing is actually just repeating, repeating uh, that line direction, okay? Okay. Um, And by repeating it, your eyes goes in, but having all of those little um, those little lines is causing a, a, a texture or a tension, okay? So this is kind of where you want to be with a pencil. And then you kind of have to figure out how ultimately how to translate that in, into, um, uh, into paint, you know, with brush strokes. Um, but I think for, for now, you want to figure out what is, what is the curve it's going to allow you to really feel that you're standing in that space. And then there's another issue that we have to solve, which is what are you going to do with this space? Oh, what happened? What's going on? Oh, um, what are you going to do with this space here? You know, how, what line, because right now it, it's kind of almost like you kind of feel like this pattern coming through here, in a sense. Right. Um, so if it's raining or the hail's coming down, are you going to put a texture that's coming in at that diagonal? That's a very violent diagonal, right? Um, is it going to be coming mm -hmm. down? Is it going to be um, well, like this across? Point. The rain had and hail had stopped, and the sun was coming out and hitting the clouds behind it, so they were just glowing orange. And so they're, I don't know, kind of cumulus cloud shapes. Okay. A part of that. See, I don't like this part coming down here because it's not, it's not following right. the curve. Um, but now you're starting out, now you can begin to see how like, all right, so th this is following that curve, right? Boom, and it comes, uh -huh. comes up. So now we can maybe even put a little cloud over here if we want, but ultimately yeah. it has to come back. Um, but having that story, figuring out that one line that works, now every decision you make, you can then judge it against your story or that or that guiding line, right? Um, right. Every line inside your cloud, clouds. If you're going to have the sun come behind there, remember that quote from um, Picasso. You know, uh, some people paint the sun as a yellow spot. Some oh yes. Take that yellow spot because of their yeah. art and their intelligence and transfer it into the sun, right? Yeah. So, you know, we, do we need a circle to make the sun? No, you can make this. You can make the sun in a square. Right. As long as that thing is radiating out that that heat, you know. So if the if this is where the the hail is coming through, and you have it coming on this angle, mm -hmm. now now you have all of these little adjustments and all these little alignments that are going on. That's making that 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 um that sun coming in and taking away that darkness, right? So right. Now, now your your story is going deeper because now somebody can look at this on two different levels. Wow, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful scene of an ocean in the sky. Or somebody could look at it and say, wow, I'm so inspired because I'm going through a storm in my life and I feel hope. Oh, interesting. Right? Because that's really what you're doing. You're radiating that energy out. One of the things Rockwell said was one of the keys to his success was to make you feel two emotions at the same time in, in a painting. So this, and we call it changing the charge, okay? So one of the things you want to do in your story is to put, put a charge. So this is one energy, and then this is another energy. Okay. Then, then, then you can even go a third if you want, you know. Um, whatever down here, but at least having two charges in, in that image. So as, 
as you start here, it's the tension, <laughs> you know, right. It even makes those noises. And then, and then over here, you're feeling a whole different vibe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, this is all done in that architectural level. And then you cloak it with the scene. So when people look at it, they see clouds and they see a sky and they see the water. What they feel is this. Okay. What they see is the scenery. That makes sense. Okay. So, so as composers, we're spending most of our time developing and designing the part of the image that nobody sees. Okay. It's very mystical work that we do. <laughs> if you guys want to become wizards and witches of art, this is how you do it. Uh, <laughs> wizards of art. I kind of like that. That's kind of neat. Um, again, because this is how it, this is the, let's say the science behind it, okay? When I draw a line, here are two lines. And I think you saw this in the video. If I go from A to B, subconsciously when I make a line, my, my, the eye follows it eternally, you know, forever left and right, okay? But if I go to A to B, I can, I can go like this. I can make a mark that lays over top of that line, or I can make a bunch of marks. Okay, it's still that alignment gives me the line. Okay, or I can again make a bunch of marks. And that works as well. So if I come back and I take, um, let me see here. And I take, oops. I take that out you see you still feel even though now we don't see that little gray line you still feel it yeah very much so so this is what the drawing process the designing process does it allows us to to manage all the stuff the invisible reality that's going on it ain't fake you know if, if you're not careful you can throw somebody's eye off into never never land and they miss your entire painting, even though you spent six months painting it out. <laughs> That's very true. All right, cool. We still got four more to go. I mean, two more to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you for your insights on that. Um, cool, cool. Connie, we're not going to talk value since we've did it twice already. Although we are going to talk value on Barb real quick, but um, you're you're actually your value actually works pretty well here um, in terms of you know if the cow is the subject, you you see like that cow still popping all the way back there. He is getting compete as you go back further. He's still there. But this 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 sky up here is competing um, a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So when you when you see that, you might just be able to bring in. Uh, where are we here? You see how just toning that down a little bit like that is is starting to. You still see a bright sky. Let me see if that's even. Working. Hmm. Oh, okay. I see what's happening here. Um, let me do that again. Okay, there we are. I 
I'd probably keep the sky where it is. Um, maybe just softening the edge of that, of the trees. Uh -huh. Might be the, yeah, there it is. Just putting a couple little, you know, to move, to, so the eye can transition from that light area into, into this area a little bit better. And doing it in such a way that it actually moves you down towards the cow, okay? Yes. Right there, it becomes like a block. Uh-huh. Here, you can already begin to see how now your eye can kind of like, boop, 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 you know, kind of pop on through. Um, this area over here, just in terms of value, it, it may be getting a little too dark. You probably just put a little, little light inside there. So you still have those little windows, but now they're toned down, right? Okay. Yeah, so that's that's working really nicely on a value level. The cow's popping. I, I personally would probably pop the cow just a little bit more. Um, well, let's just see what that looks like. Let's keep everything exactly the same. What is that noise? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my <laughs> puppy. It's your what? Puppy, I have oh. a little puppy. <laughs> <laughs> He's teeny. <laughs> Meet Reba. Teeny? <laughs> uh oh. Hi, Reba. <laughs> you guys need to go take uh, a bathroom break there? That's fine. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to pop those uh, values a little bit more. And then um, uh, kind of like I want to be able to pop this little cow out. There we are. And then maybe have his little butt kind of fall back into the um, into the scene. And now when you now when you walk in to that gallery, he pops, you know. And and it's just and and there's a way of actually planning out all of your values before you ever mix paint so that you can strategically and intelligently and intentionally make sure that every value in your painting works before you, before you like I said, before you mix paint. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to teach you how to do that here. I gotta keep some cookies out there. But, um, there's a way of doing that. Plus, there's also a way of learning how to compose all your colors before you mix paint. If you study, like, um, there's notation systems. Um, here, I'll, I'll share that with you here. Um, so if you mix, when you're dealing with a color wheel, right? Um, let's say you have yellow up here, uh, blue, Actually, it's probably a little bit more down here. And you have red here, okay? And you mix the three of those, it gives you a neutral gray, okay? So what we want to do is, is your neutral gray, let's say we want to make a yellow color, right? So what we do is we draw a line that's facing up because on the color wheel, the yellow is vertical. And then what we want to do is either it's going to be a high saturation, um, a mid-tone, like a mid-saturation, or a low saturation, or a neutral. Okay, you could actually break it down further. Say mid, I mean a high, mid, neutral, and then um, a saturation in between. So this becomes a really bright yellow, and this becomes... Uh, a gray, a neutral. This may become a, I think it's a, I want to say a burnt sienna, right? Or, or something where it's a dark, dark, um, dull yellow. So right there, we've picked the color. We picked a saturation and we use a, a nine, a nine scale for our values. So if you wanted a mid tone, you might put a five. If you wanted um, 
So if we want a very light yellow, high saturation, we might do a, a two. And now we create this little notation that as you're planning out all the colors, if you're out there and you see something so beautiful, you're trying to like, oh my gosh, like I want to capture that, but I don't have my paints with me. You grab a pen and you start analyzing the color and saying, okay, what, what color is it? Well, that, that's a blue. Well, is it a saturated blue? Is it more of a gray or more fully saturated blue? Well, it's kind of somewhere in between. Okay, great. Well, what value is it? Is it a very dark blue or a light blue? Well, it's kind of closer to the middle, but it leans a little light. So maybe it'll be a, a three or a two. Okay. So now when you take this little notation, you can go back to your studio and mix that color exactly as you saw it. But that is for another day. Um, in terms of design, let me show you uh, just a, a fun way of playing around with your composition before you get to painting. Um, Connie, are you the one who paints on panels? Yes. Then you are my favorite today. Um, so this works for you perfectly. Depending on the, how you answer the next question, it works for you perfectly. Are you able to cut your panels any shape you want? Yes. Wee! <laughs> Sorry, you just made me very happy. <laughs> See, I believe the best way to live life is from the heart, not the head. Okay? It got to start from the heart then move to the head. And people say, well, what's the difference between the two? Now, you might be asking, why do I always talk like esoterically like this? And this is one of the models at the academy, as in art, so in life. So all, everything that we're teaching you on Canvas, you apply it to your own life. So, or vice versa. So if the heart some people get confused, like which is the head and which is a heart. For, for me, the way I, I determine which one I'm existing in is the heart is the eternal optimist. It is expansive. It is the one that believes. It is the one that hopes and sees potential. It is the one that will encourage you to move forward. The head, by nature, is the constrictor. It's the limiter. It's the manager, right? The heart is the entrepreneur. It's the creative energy. The head, it's going to calculate everything and assess the risks of everything. And so it wants to hold you back, not necessarily in a bad way. Sometimes we have to listen to that. <laughs> but the heart is the spirit. It is eternal. The head is, you know, when we die, it dies with us. <laughs> so the painting oftentimes it started from the head, not the heart, because you go to the store, you buy a canvas, and now it t dictates to you, you have to now create something that fits pleasingly within the borders that I have now imposed on you, says the canvas. But as a composer, we say, shh, gaiete. We create the image. So what does that mean? Um, this is why I tell artists, don't ever start designing in a box because by putting this box here, your brain now has to calculate what, what it, what's gonna go in here pleasingly. Get rid of the box and think about your story, okay? Ooh, I want to die like this little cow. Yeah, I like the little cow. Yeah. And I want to put him inside of a setting. I want to put him inside of a setting. You're free to expand. Then, um, years ago, we used to do composition. We called it a seven-layer system, right? It was like layer five that we actually got to the point of actually putting a box around the image. So the, the box, the rectangle, the field that we call it, the canvas size is dictated by the story. A story is not dictated by the canvas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The fact that you can cut your panels versus being um, a slave to a canvas that you bought. Now, if you stretch your own canvases, then you have freedom. It just requires a lot more work. 
right? But cutting panels, you, you're going to be able to play with so many different amazing shapes and, uh, and have such freedom and variety and to really focus on what it is that you're trying to communicate, what the subject, the story is, and then like a flower, let it blossom out from there rather than trying to fit it and cram it into a space. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. So how can I give you a practical example of that using what um, you have here? So again, like I said, the, the mind is going to calculate all kinds of math, okay? We don't need to talk about the math, but we do need to just understand that that's what's going on. So what I would do is if this was a sketch, not a final painting, it was just a sketch, and I would say, man, I wonder, and again, I'm not giving you a, a, a you must do this, I'm just playing, I'm having fun in this world of composition. And I'm saying, what if we take the cow, and this is called a notional space, okay? Now what we could do is take the whole cow, but in all honesty, I really, I really love the body of the cow. It's also why I like goats because they're just so rectangular. I like that shape so much more, okay, than the whole, the whole cow. So what I could do then from there is a couple things. I could flip this, now I have a reciprocal, and now I know where I can place the cow's head, right? Where his body can start, where his head, and you kind of intuitively did that already, okay? So I'm just going to keep doing that over and over and over again, and all I want you to really feel here is the beauty of the space that just keeps blossoming itself out, okay? So we can extend this and, and nothing's arbitrary. We got the, the, the first square from the, from, from the size of the cow, right? And now we're just making decisions. Um, so we expand it to now the width is the same width as the cow, right? And we can just keep doing that over and over again. Okay, now this is getting a little, little thick here, but you, you get the point. Oops, boom, okay. Um, now let's go ahead and move all of this up. So now what we can do is maybe move, oops. Mm -hmm. Maybe move this one down here. Okay, so now he's, he's kind of in the center, which isn't gonna look nice. But what we can do is say, okay, well, if we want to shift it up, how could we do that? Well, one thing, we just take this measurement here that we have, and maybe we go up two, okay? And then we shift this one up two. Now, let me shrink all of this down so you can see kind of what's going on here. All right, so we're putting the cow right in that little spot, okay? Now what we need to do is figure out, okay, how much are we going to come out? So maybe what we do is we come over here, and now that gives us that side, okay? So ultimately what we've just done is created... Let's do this. There we are. A rectangle.
that gives us a very neat little shape that automatically relates to the cow, to the cow right? Mm, the yeah. height of the cow, the distance from the side to, to, the, to the edge of the painting of the cow, the distance from the cow's butt to the edge of the other side and the height of where he is. Like it, and then imagine if you had all of this architecture and you started fiddling around with um, the edge of this building would, would, you know, might come over and land right there, okay? Now, all of that is starting to work based on the cow. Mm -hmm. Does that make any, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, oh, wait, something's wrong here. There we are. I was like, that didn't look as nice as it did before. <laughs> Um, so now like even the space back here now is in direct relationship to the cow. How big do you make these windows? What shape do you make those windows? You know, um, and this is just one way that you can play around by taking an object in your image. And what you can do is you, you just basically do this. This is a very expensive tool, but I'm going to show you what it is. Okay. Um, can you see my camera? It's called a notepad, like a sticky note. Very expensive. Yeah. Um, so you can take a piece of paper and draw two lines on it. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that uh, here on, on this um, thingamajiggy on the computer. Okay, grab a piece of paper, rip it, or, or sticky note or whatever. Um, I'm going to make it a little darker so that you can see it. Okay. And then what you can do is you can come over here to the, to the edge of the cow. And this is good if you have like an old piece of work or a sketch and you're drawing and, and you just, or if you're doing plain air or whatever, and you kind of want to just kind of keep repeating the same measurements, just put a little, if you want to get to that center of the cow, boom, right? And what you can do is you can flip this and come this direction. So now we know um, and say that the butt of the cow is here, right? So now what we have here is, is um, you want to keep it on a straight edge, okay? You have like a little homemade ruler that gives you certain measurements and spaces that automatically relate to the cow and so you can come over here and say you know maybe what I need to do is uh, oops, come to the edge and say you know th this little flower thing this little bush needs to end here you can't go past that by making it end here now it's in now it relates to the cow right um, you can take this a uh, little tool. Mm, hold on. My mind is going faster than my computer skills. Okay. You can come here and say, okay, well, let's figure out this. Well, that, that's really, that works really nice. Okay. So this width, now how, how high should it be? Well, let's take a look. Well, basically, what you have there relates to the cow, okay? But do you see how now you're pulling away the arbitrary part of it and you're actually becoming very intentional about it? Um, what, what about the, the roof? So now what we can do is come in here and start making all of these, these marks. You can actually even do a rhythm, boom, you know, a wide one, a middle one, a wide one. And it has a rhythm to it. Now you're making music and it, and it harmonizes with the cow. Because remember when you jumped earlier onto that piece of paper, your mind is doing all of these calculations and you're giving the mind order. It's like, oh man, there's something, you know, all the calculations, you're hitting them, boom, boom, boom.
that has a certain rhythm versus that which is just random, right? Music that's random is noise. <laughs> when it has order and timing and spacing, you know. And the, the, Bruce Lee said, music isn't the notes, it's the space between the notes. So it's the same thing here. You're composing not just the object, but the spacing of, of the objects. Cool? So just take a little piece of paper and whatever you're drawing, you know, just and play around with it. You know, is the spacing between the head of this cow and, and, and this um, post here, could that be better? Um, well, let's take your little measurement thing. But we can see that if you just shift it over just a little bit, so let's do that just so that we can see what that would look like. Mm. Look at that. Oh, let me do it right. Mm. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, holy cow. <laughs> All right, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that little shift makes that cow feel free. It changes, if you're looking at that cow and you're like, huh, I wonder what that cow's thinking. The thought that that cow is having right now versus that is very, very different. That's a big difference. Yeah. Hmm. You see now when you look at this space, it feels right and your eye comes down and sees, I think this is like a place where, where, where there may be water in it. Yeah. Right? Here, yes. You didn't even realize that before. The majority of the water is on this side. So it's hiding. It, it, it makes you feel like he's not cared for. Here, he's free. He's cared for. It, it's strange how it works. Yeah. It's just a little kicking. And, and this is why I forget who asked me. I think it might have been you. Like, uh, do you want to send like a, a you know a description of the work or whatever uh, with with the painting? And I said no. Just the painting should be able to be read by itself. Okay. And part of the reason why I don't like that, you know, getting stuff beforehand is because I I enjoy the discovery process. You know, like coming through and just stumbling upon these things as as well. But um, it's that was fun that was that was really fun that little that little thing so that's my gift to you grab a piece of paper while you're sketching things out um just take one day just one day in your process and just add one extra day to your process and just kind of go back and use a piece of paper and start just playing around with your spacing your values are nice you're telling a neat story you know um, so you're kind of strong uh, intuitively on those things. Um, I would just encourage you to, to push space and mainly because your process in terms of creating your panels, man, you can create whatever space you want. You, you have that, that freedom. Okay. Great. Cool. Yeah. All right. Wildflower. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> and um okay cool i have to say this i really love your color um and i usually don't make comments on color again maybe it's just i'm really really hungry like i want to <laughs> i want to devour this thing so <laughs> I was hungry when I painted it. Huh? The emotion I put into it. <laughs> so tell me the story on this. What is either the, the feeling or sensation you want us to feel, or what is the narrative behind it? 
Um, well, this particular piece, I was looking to um, do something that I felt was a little bit more of a traditional still life, going back to the um, a little bit more realistically rendered um, objects as well as the a really dark background. Um, what I think of when I see um, more traditional um, setting like that is uh, that it's very dramatic. The lighting on it's very dramatic. Um, and so that was one thing that I was trying to achieve. I put a strong spotlight on it to, um, to, to create that sense of drama that is there. Um, the, um, the objects themselves were chosen um, primarily as a uh, shape and color, but also um, the fact that I have uh, interspersed a lot of organic objects in there is very important to the whole thing. Um, if all I was interested in was the shape and color of an object, I could have put little vases, pitchers, um, creamers, that type of thing in there, but it was important to me to have the, um, the fruit and the flowers in there uh, because that was a part of what I was feeling or wanting to put into this painting was the, the, the life, the sense that, that these were not just objects, that they were um, living, tangible objects that you mm -hmm. could eat you wanted to. So outside of light, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I was trying to get what you were saying. And um, outside of light, I'm still unsure what it is that you're we're trying to do with this image um i do get like you're bringing in the fruit and obviously the fruit is there the color is beautiful the organic nature of it but again all those are just describing the noun so if, if we have the sentence the dog fence you've just told me about the texture of the fence and the color of the fence and what kind of dog it is, but I still have no idea what the dog is doing. Is he peeing on the fence? Is he jumping over the fence? Is he sleeping in front of the fence? Is he under the, sleeping under the fence? You know, is he chasing a rabbit through the fence? So I don't know what he's doing. And, um, but I do know that he's a small brown dog, right? Right. And I know that it's a big white fence, you know, but I still don't know what the relationship, what is it that you're trying to do? So I know there's light in it. I know there's organic fruit in there, um, but I'm still not sure what it is that you're trying to capture in terms of quote unquote verb or essence. And I think that you have um, exactly expressed my, um, my confusion as to just what it is how my still lifes relate to the story. Um, because I don't know, uh, how does a still life tell a story? I mean, I get with, with Deb Sky and, and the drama and, uh, um, you know, Connie's cow and, and all of that, but. Connie's cow. <laughs> uh, I just, I don't know. I guess I don't know what the story is that I'm trying to say, other, other than um, that I set the objects up basically to create a very pleasing design. Or uh, you're, you're just relying on your good looks to get through life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble then, aren't I? <laughs> See, seriously, in, in terms of the painting, wow, look at, the, look at that color, you know? Wow, that's pretty. And then when you step in, you're like, okay. So um, what do you want to do with your future? And all you hear is the drip of the drool. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and the eyes batting, what? You know? And anyone at some level of, who appreciates intelligence, and obviously you have a, an amazing intelligence, right? then we'll say, okay, it's pretty, let me move on. And that's wrong because the time that you put into it, the intelligence that you have, 
um, it needs to somehow go deeper. And, um, and let me tell you, you know, I don't, well, this, I'm going to lie to you for a minute. Okay. I don't want to know your stories. Truth is I do, but I don't need to know your stories. Okay. But that wild side of the flower needs to start coming out in your painting. Okay. <laughs> because, and, 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 and again, you don't have to go narrative. What I'm saying is it's a wild flower. We're looking at the pretty flower, but everybody loves the wild part of the wild flower. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, and it's the energy, it's the life. Um, the beauty is going to be there. It's just, that's just you. I don't know what you were like when you were 20, but I can probably say you were probably super hot, right? <laughs> so, she, still, she still is. Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. The beauty is there, you know? I mean, you got gorgeous white hair, the way you wear your style. I mean, all kinds of cool stuff. It's, it's there. But what we need to do is stop hiding behind it. And, and you have to be, push yourself because if you don't, I'm going to be honest with you, your, your, your paintings will die with you. They'll always just be something pretty, nice to look at. Well, okay. You've told me the problem. Now give me a solution or at least start me in some direction towards a solution. I would, I would probably challenge you and maybe not do it as public pieces but figure out some way and maybe start with a narrative. Um, I, I don't think your power is in the narrative. Okay. Um, but one of the things we talk about is changing the charge. What is um, going from one state of mind to another? Okay. Raising the consciousness. Your life is about that. Right. Again, we don't need to know the details, but your life is about that. Somehow you pulled it together, right? And we're able to make a life. Um, and again, I'm just pulling this from our one conversation together, okay? Uh, there is power in that. Inspirational power. You have an ability through even still lives to, to um, communicate whatever it was, that magic that allowed you to mature into the person that you are today, right? Um, so when I'm looking at these uh, images, I find it very interesting that all of the fruit is untouched. All of the flowers are untouched, except for this orange here and these grapes. There are no grapes that are, are isolated except for these three. There are no other fruits in here that are bitten, that are open, that are touched, you know, only right here. Now, let me ask you, did you do that intentionally? Um, well, I did it intentionally as a um, sense of design. I don't know that uh, it had any deeper meaning behind it. If it did, then I guess I'm not, a, I was not aware of it. Fair um, enough. I, I wanted, one of the reasons why I peeled open the orange was because one thing that I really love is uh, uh, when a, the interior of an orange is uh, open and displayed, it is almost translucent and has a certain glow to it. And that's one reason why I did that. But um, to say that it went any deeper than that, I... See that? Well, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, because you could say that your story, and again, I'm now in, I'm imposing a story on top of it. The key is to get to the story before you get to this stage, right? But in the midst of this crowd, there are those who lay their soul bare, and they're bare. And this is this is what you were talking about with the flower and your other work, having that uh, illuminating nature of the inside of the person or the inside of the flower, that life coming out. Mm 
-hmm. Okay. So let's go with that. That's what you want want to reveal. Now, what's beautiful about the, what the about the grapes is that grapes are always a symbol of divinity or spirit, regality, right? Mm -hmm. So right. now you 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 could say that your story would be that this is you, the little orange, open bear, vulnerable. The inside is glowing, and out comes these three pieces of fruit, right? Now, on on that level, what I would say is get rid of this one here on, on a composition le level. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see if we can do this here. Uh -oh. Okay, and shift, shift it over here. And then uh, I'm gonna go back Pop this one out. Oops. Yeah. See now, uh, this is kind of flowing out. You could probably bring it down there. Okay. Now, now the eye is like rolling out. Okay. And you already have like this little curve, this beautiful little arabesque that's coming through here. Um, maybe we even fall back a little bit, come down. I kind of wish there was more table to the bottom so that the eye could move through here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But but you're kind of getting where I'm going with that. Uh, the thing that was driving me crazy from the beginning was this little area here, this high point of contrast, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So if we want to make the um, the orange glow, well, then you know what we have to do. We have to get rid of this. And you might bring in a color that's going to make that orange glow a little bit. Maybe um, probably need something with a little bit more blue in it. Like a bluish gray here. There we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops, I put it on the wrong layer. You can start to see how that, that's now fading back there. Like this is punching you in the eye, right? This is beginning to fade. So one of the reasons why it's not, it, it, it's still harsh is because of this dark, this dark that's back here. So what we now need to do is kind of go in here and, and lower the darkness of that. So now you can have a value in there that's some. Um, the teapot is not important to the story if the story is about those orange shining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe we now need to radiate out. And I'm not saying the color uh, choice that I'm using there is, is, I'm not really thinking color necessarily. I'm just trying to, how do you take that orange and begin to expand it past its form? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So a lot of times, this is something that I heard yesterday that I thought was very, very cool. Uh, we're going to give you guys a little physical exercise. You don't have to stand up to do this, but um, just make sure you have some room. Um, A lot of times when we think of ourselves, right, we kind of just think of our torso, our head, like that's who we are. Very tight. This is me. The reality is, if you put your hands out as far as you can go and put your hands up, everybody do it. Put your hands as far as out, right? That's who you are. 
That's your notional space. That's the space that Barb takes. So how do you expand this little tiny orange to become the dominant, most wonderful thing in this image? So there's a couple things that we would want to do as, as a designer. Now we're talking design. Um, let's go ahead and gray this. Oops. Oh, that's right. Okay. So let me see if this does it. All right. So you can see right now, the reason why that ain't working is because that flower is now, now the higher contrast. Um, your original, you can see that that spot on the, on the, um, on the teapot is the highest point of contrast, right? Right. Now we got rid of that. Mm -hmm. Now the flower is, Okay, so this is why it's really important to do a value study and figure out your values before you go into paint. This way you have a plan of attack. So now the question is, what do you got to do to make that orange that high point of boom, right? So what do you got to do to make that orange that high point of contrast, okay? Um, and then... If we want to say that the, the, the inside of the orange is, is radiating out. So what I see here in the image naturally from what you've done is you have this curve coming through here, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're moving the eye to this section and you're moving the eye up and around, okay? That's how you're moving the eye. I'm going to use the word problem, okay? It's not a problem because you did a great job at it. But in my mind, the problem with it is, is that this is very much like a Renaissance painting where the design is just moving you around the image. The Baroque, it moves you in and out of the image, okay? So how can you use line like you're using it but rather than just making sure that you're moving the person around the image, how do you make the design radiate out? So now it's not just moving my eye around, it's actually broadcasting out to me. It's calling to me as I walk by. So you can use a curve strategy like this, right? You can use um, radiating point, making sure that not only when my eye is in that it's going to it, but that it's actually radiating out to me, okay? Mm -hmm. And then again, you're gonna then now adjust this leaf so it ends here. You might bring a, a darker value in here, per, you know. Now you're creating these alignments that your eye then comes back to this orange. I mean, this, it's still a still life, but now it's becoming very, very profound. Mm -hmm. And it's going to require you to, to spend time with you and to, and to see how honest and how, how vulnerable you're going to make your own self. Now, again, the challenge is, is how do you, how do you do that without going into the details of the nouns of the, of the, of, you know, the, the minutia of, of these things? How do you go into those stories personally, extract the power of those things that enabled you to survive through them, to thrive through them, you know, to have fun through them, you know, whatever those things are. And then how do you put that into an image? And, you know, that's not, that's just not an hour conversation, you know. Um, the uh, because that's really the gift, and then what you get to do is take that message, cloak it in 
beautiful flower paintings and fruit paintings. And you'll hear someone, man, you know, every time I look at that painting, I just, I just feel alive. I feel like I start my day magically, you know? It has nothing to do with the subject or if it's a still life or not, or a landscape or a portrait. It's what is this thing radiating? What is the sensation that's going out? You know, what's the personality of these, of these fruit? You know, are they, are they supporting this unveiling? Or are they making fun of it? Or are they saying, no, 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 put your clothes back on, girl. <laughs> There's also something else that I see in here that I, I really like. Um, I do really like this, be uh, this beautiful little arabesque that's happening. Your eye kind of wraps around here. Okay. So this is a second or third time now where I want to feel that there's more to the bottom of this image. Okay. So again, you know, I, I would just get rid of this highlight here, figure out how to really make that orange that glow. And then just using the nuances, see how this curve curves down here like this? Well, how can you, you know, oops, maybe by bringing this little value in here, now you can see how this little highlight now shoots you this way. Mm -hmm. Shoots you this way rather than before it shot you down here. So it's those little nuances that are moving you back to that orange that the eye calculates, it sees it, and it, it all comes back to this, to this orange. So that's one way, again, we didn't talk about a narrative. We didn't say, well, you know, the, the orange is going to market and it's standing in line and it's waiting for, you know, it to get its grapes or buy its cigarettes, you know, up here or whatever, I don't know, whatever, you know. It's not a narrative. You still do have a storyline. And in this case, you're taking the storyline and making it more of a personal storyline. And maybe not everybody will um, well, know that I'm talking about me, but you still have a story. Yes. And I, I don't think that I typically think that way when I'm painting a painting. Um, and maybe that's what I'm missing. I mean, I, that's what I'm hearing from you is that that's what I need to do. I, I need to um, I need to have meaning behind my paintings rather than just painting something because I want it to be pretty. Yes. I know a bunch of artists, I had a, an, artist, an artist named Deb coming to me once because she's been painting professionally for 40 years. She teaches art. You know, she makes a great living as an artist. But she was about ready to pack it on up because the passion died. She just got tired of painting pots because they sold. And she, she, amazing. Give me one second. I think somebody burned down a house or they died or something. Okay, good. Um, and the big breakthrough with her was understanding that it's story. It's the why, you know. Um, big difference between Freud and Jung is that Jung came along and gave you the why, you know. <laughs> it just wasn't about the how-to. Um, it's, it's about who am I? You, you, you're an amazing painter, amazing painter, but they got said there are much better painters than I, but because I remember I'm a draftsman first, I will be the one that they remember. So he, he knew. And we're really huge on legacy. 
at the academy. So, you know, you want to be, and everybody has their stories, you know, I mean, we all, it doesn't matter how wonderful or how crappy your life is. We all have victories and we all have, you know, victim and ease. I don't know what you call it. Like, you know, tragedies. Yeah, there's the word. <laughs> um, so we're all walking Shakespeare, you know, it doesn't matter how it played out. The fact that we all have it, you know, and then we get to put it in our work. And um, I just encourage you to, 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 to go deeper, to go deeper, you know, on the surface, it's gorgeous. Just go deeper. Okay, well, that's, I, you know, I'm not sure I know how to, but I, but I will certainly um, spend some time evaluating that and see what I come up with. <laughs> I don't see myself, I guess, when I'm, when I'm setting my, my setups up, I don't see myself being that introspective. Um, but I'll try. But you have to ask yourself, not every, I mean, and I, I get that that's not everybody's forte, right? Um, uh, there's some people who are just, you know, they just, they just want to be happy, you know, and their happiness is, is found in just constantly moving forward and, and eating up life, you know, and sitting around and thinking is boring as crap to them. And then they, 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 they feel like, like they're, you know, they feel like they're being deprived of life. And then there are people who feel like, you know, uh, Mount Everest would be great to go see. There was this funny movie, I forget what it was called, but it was basically like um, it was with Barbara Streisand and uh, this comedian guy, Seth Goldin or whatever his name is. And, you know, they're like a little Jewish mom and, and son couple or whatever. And, they went on this road, I think it's called road trip actually. And they went on this road trip to go find this guy or whatever, or his dad, I don't know what it was. And um, they get to the Grand Canyon, right? And they're <laughs> and it's just hilarious. They get to the Grand Canyon, they, they see it. And they're only there maybe about 23 seconds. And they're like, they just look at each other and they're like, all right, that's done. Let's move on, you know? Like, and my brother and I just died laughing because that's exactly how we would be. And my brother, he's a, he's a magician. So he, he travels the world and he takes all these pictures of all these places, but he always constantly is like, I just want to be home, you know? <laughs> like playing in my, tinkering on things, right? It's like, eh. And for me, I you know, oh great, climb, climb Mount Everest. I get far more enjoyment and I feel far more alive sitting in a chair just going inward rather than outward. Both are amazing, you know? I mean, so you can paint a little tiny flower in your garden or you can go out and paint, you know, angel waterfall or in the Amazon or whatever, right? Both are, are, are beautiful. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe the profoundness isn't going deeper into your own stories. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, but somehow you have to go, you have to go deeper and it may not be the way that I suggested this is why I wish Bill was here because he could tell you exactly how to do it. <laughs> yeah, he, he came up with some good things during the interview. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Bill. Bill is. Um, uh, I call him the CYO, the Chief Yoda Officer. And, uh, <laughs> I'm just a young Jedi when it comes to him, but um, you know, and and. and and, and, you know, and you might just take this and, and go have a conversation with him again, you know. I think that would probably be the wiser thing because I, I know I get a little too serious about things and kind of, you know, and. Um, well, and, no, I mean, I, I value your input. Um, and I, you, you blow me away with what you illustrate and what you do now. It, it's really a, a treat. 
to sit and, and watch, whether it's been just videos where you have uh, basically uh, described and diagrammed out the masters or uh, you know something like this where it's much more personal. It's, it's great to see because I'm so close friends with these guys to, to see um, what you're bringing to them is, is a very cool thing. Um, so I am not in, in any way discounting uh, your suggestions. Uh, I'm just, I guess still, I, I don't know where that leads me. I, I'm not sure that I am that person that you're, you're talking about that, um, that has this kind of storyline. I've never, you said uh, narrative, I've never done um, narratives with my mm -hmm. work. Um, and um, maybe I just need to find another way of expressing something that's a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, would, I would encourage you, go talk with Bill because I know, I know when I'm right and I know when I'm wrong. And in this case, what I'm right about is that you are far deeper than what you let on, okay? How you f get that and, and how you, you know, and what you do, like how do you pull that out? I don't know you well enough to do that, uh, to, to tell you how to do that, but I think that's something that you could probably have a really fun conversation with Bill on and, and he would probably nail it like in, you know, the first two seconds. Um, I just could know. I something in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Barb and I, we both are like real workhorses about stuff. And I think something that might hang both of us up is we kind of fall into a blue collar work ethic and tend to not get dreamy or romantic about things. And, you know, it's kind of like, okay, what's, how do you find the door to step into that? Wow, way of that's powerful. That is, that's great. Dad. That's really powerful. You know, <laughs> there's, um, John Adams has had a quote, and what was it, and it was, the first generation are farmers, the second generation are doctors and lawyers, and the third generation are artists. And then there's a Chinese proverb that almost says exactly the same thing, that the first generation are farmers, and the second are, are doctors, and the third are musicians, right? And okay. and hearing it from two different cultures, two different sides of the world, I'm like, there's some, some hard truth in that thing. And, uh, and so I've always wondered, like, well, what generation am I? You know, can you jump from one generation to another generation? Um, and... and, and and then also, how do I prepare my children? You know, what are they? But what's interesting is when you look at the farmer, their intelligence is in their hands. It's in their labor, right? Mm -hmm. the doctors and the lawyers, their intelligence, their, their, their value and their intelligence is in their mind, right? And then the artist, it's in their soul. It's in their heart. It's an, it's an emotional intelligence, um, is it possible we have three generations within ourselves and it's a matter of personal growth? That's very, very possible. Very possible. And the question now is, at this time in your life, do, do you want to force yourself through an evolution? Myself? I'm very excited by your discussion about the Baroque and looking at the Caravaggio painting. It made me think differently about my response to the world. So I guess I don't think I'm going to be forcing myself, but I feel like I'm opening my eyes to mm. something that's always there. But I suddenly now have been given an idea how to look at it differently. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Great. Yeah, I, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, and, and I will say I am also um, just from the, the different things that um, I have learned in, 
even just in, from a design standpoint, I feel that I am ready to get back to the canvas and try some things. And I will say, uh, <laughs> okay. I will do some designing before I start painting. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been, you know, and I think part of this is because I've always felt as if my time at the um, easel was so limited because I've always worked a full-time job. So it's like, okay, you've got one day, you've got eight hours to create a piece, and so get up there and start throwing the paint on it. And um, I am a very fast painter anyway. Um, but I think that that has always um, been probably something that has held me back from becoming uh, better at the, the processes leading up to developing and creating a, a beautiful painting. Um, and so I'll slow down, I'll, I'll step back and, and I'll start taking some more time on those uh, um, beginnings. Um, I, I find it inter interesting that as I've gotten older, I have learned how important it is to prepare for things. Um, an example for me has been in doing like um, painting a, a room in a house. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I always just like dumped the paint into the and started slathering on the wall and then I'd have to clean up a mess afterwards and I finally realized one day that taking the time to tape the windows and put down a drop cloth have your tools laid out properly really mm -hmm. created a better end result and was less stressful so I guess I have to take that um, knowledge and, and philosophy into my artwork a, a, a little bit deeper anyway <laughs> one, one way to help you with that um is to try to figure out how to take uh, the finished product, right? And rather than giving yourself the joy of accomplishing the finish, saying, oh man, if I just, you know, I'm gonna get this painting done. And, <laughs> and yeah. until it's done, you ain't happy. Right. So how do you actually give yourself four or five, six small wins before the final win, right? You know, oh man, I laid out my paints, I mixed my paints, and boom, that's all I'm going to do today because that's it, you know. And now you have a win, right? And then, okay, I'm going to take just one day and I'm just going to plan out my design. I'm not going to think about color. I'm not going to think about texture. I'm not going to really even think about the drawing per se. I just want to figure out all, ooh, yeah, and I got that, right? Hot diggity dog, you know. <laughs> and you win, and you win, and you win. And now all of these small wins builds up into this big win, right? And, um, and I think that might be one way of approaching it um, so that it's always fresh, it's always something new, but it's still moving to the end goal, which is the final execution of a painting, you know? Yeah. At Maxwell Parrish, he would spend a year on a painting yeah. because he would design it like, like, you know, like a mother rectangle, and, and then he would paint it and he would put it outside and, and he would let it dry for like, I think it was like a month at a time or two weeks or whatever it was. So, I mean, it was a really long process. Um, but you look at his work, it's insane, right? It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sargent used to do that. People, you know, oh my gosh, he, you know, he paints so fast, blah, 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 blah. And yet that, that painting were... Uh, with the dancer and the, and the people were the, that thing took over a year to paint. Now he probably spent eight months composing it. Mm -hmm. And then the painting to execute the painting was, was, was much quicker, but, um, but to work out all of where the lights were, the values that were going to be used uh, the movements, the sound, how do you design the sound, you know, all, all those things. Um, because, You can approach a painting like a guy with a guitar and a hat at his feet in, in the subway. And he's playing really beautiful music. And it's cool. Or you can approach it like a master composer in charge of an orchestra. 
and your lines are the strings and your values are the percussion, you know, and your, your job is to lead that audience into an experience and you have to manage all, you know, so it's both are valid, but you know, we're, we're composers. So we're dealing with the orchestra, you know, and, um, it's interesting, I think, because it seems to me as if the whole um, plein air movement, which has become so popular, um, is, is really um, promotes the immediacy of that just dive in, just paint, um, and, and it really um, is quite different from what I am learning from you. Absolutely. Uh, Michelle is a plein air painter. And we're working on um, taking the, the 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 composition course, which is really for studio artists. And after you go through the studio part of it, so that you get it, then you'll be, we'll be able to put you through the plain air composition course, which basically gives you a streamlined version of it, so that when you're out there, you can compose. Uh, on the spot um, but when she went through it she realizes now that her pl plain air paintings are what they are but really they're just really beautiful sketches at the end of the day and then she can take that and go make a masterpiece in her studio because Thomas Cole uh, who was basically the, the, the father of American painting um, he would paint these huge paintings of the Catskills. But he would go out and spend time in the Catskills and, and he would take notes, just, just notes. I don't know what his notes were, if they were written, if they were notations, if they were small drawings, but he would just take notes and notes. He, then he would go back and he would compose out these, these, these paintings and these landscapes. And the thing is, is everyone knew it was the Catskills but you can never find that location because it was totally invented. Oh, wow. Because he had notes. He was capturing the energy, the essence of those places. And then he created a cat skill that doesn't exist. And yet anyone who knows those mountains knows that's exactly what, where, where that is. That's cool. <laughs> that's, that's great, yeah. And especially, yeah. I mean, it was during a time when photography and, and that was not um, nearly as available. So uh, yeah. everything had to be either through um, sketching, diagramming, uh, note taking, and, and memory. So I think a lot of times when artists do stuff and they say, oh, it's done, I look at it and I'm like, man, that's such a great study. It's a great sketch. And if they just, and the problem is this, um, it's, it's not the artist's fault. It, it's just that we stopped learning this stuff about 100 years ago. They removed it out of the schools. So there are a couple artists, really, really, really old artists, who know this stuff and they were lucky because they're really like the last generation that got it. I mean, the people like in their eighties, nineties, you know, like they, they still like they were taught this, but when you read Norman Rockwell's writings, he talks about the decline of this, you know, he, he, and for all, for all kinds of reasons, uh, Kenyon Cox, uh, back at the turn of the century talks about it. And he's kind of employing the, uh, the artists, you know, don't take, don't take, you know, be careful with what you take from the French Revolution, you know, <laughs> like he warned against that. He, he said, you got to go spend time in nature. Artists aren't spending t enough time in nature. He talked about industrialization and how we were losing that classic spirit of crafting a great work of art because the industrial age could just produce out a whole bunch of cr crap you know, whatever it was, you know, and now as an, a working artist, you got to compete with a machine. It kind of reminds you of that, uh, that poem or that song back in grade school, you know, John Henry, whatever, or, you know, he would 
hacks, you know, against the machine, the steam engine, you know, and then you got to face the computer nowadays, all kinds of stuff. But, um, so just the sad thing is for the last three generations of artists, they just don't know. And that's why when they see me do this stuff, they're like, what, where the heck did this come from? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and sometimes you can get really, really happy. Like, yes. You know? And sometimes you can get really, really pissed because you're just like, what? all the money, all the time, all the sincerity, all the passion that I put into it, and this wasn't made available to me? Why? Why? And, uh, and this is why I do all those videos. I do this stuff, and I video it, and I post it, because whatever goes on the internet will be there forever. <laughs> and, and I want to make sure that this information is never hidden from a generation or two or three generations again. So that's why I just keep working at this all the time. So... Well, ladies, you've been very generous. Uh, yes. Yes. Very yeah. generous. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, I encourage you guys, if you want to learn, learn how to do this and you want to be part of a community of artists who are doing this so that you can have a conversation, not only with other people, but for yourself, I absolutely encourage you to get, get enrolled at the Academy, you know, well, this is what we call a meetup, and we do this once a week in small groups. Um, so right now we have three small groups going, and um, you know, and, and no matter how big we get, you'll always be smart, part of a small group like this. So you build those relationships and that encouragement, and you have a common language, you have uh, you know common instruction, and um, and just keep growing, you know. Um, so. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you're welcome to ask me either in composition or the academy. Um, and that's it. So I'm all ears if, if anything. Do you have different courses at the academy, or is there one course that you that someone attends or signs up for? At this time, only one course. So the only thing we do is focus on. Um, Composition, right? But you have to take that one com. I mean, that's what I mean. The composition yeah. is one composition course. Yeah. And you, so everyone enrolls in that same course. Yeah, it comes from the French idea of you know, back in France years ago, when a student would come into the atelier, they would sit in the back of the room. And they would do that for almost three years. And they were not allowed to um, ask questions. They weren't allowed to do anything except listen. And the reason why was because by the time, every year they would move up a spot. And then by the third year, they would actually be at the easels in the back of the room. And the reason why was because when the instructor came along to instruct, they had the language. So when the instructor came and said, you need to put your broke here, you need to put your sinister here, you know, the reciprocals need to be like this, they understood what was going on. So my thought is to design one system, right, that instructs, that gives you, and I noticed my, my uh, little video froze, but anyways, um, that gives you the uh, the conversation and the language and the and the and the skills, okay. But it's in the meetups where you get to have those organic conversations, and in those small groups where people speak into your life. And and sometimes you know we've seen artists who've been at it for 20, 30 years talk to a newbie, and the newbie says something that just changes everybody, you know, in the in the group, right? And so, and then I remember one time, little Costanza, ah, Costanza, um, she's the queen bee of us all. And uh, uh, she came to one of the meetups and she shared this concept that she learned when she was studying in Japan about the dragon's eye. And it just totally opened up a whole new world to us all. And, um, and she was just saying there's that, that, that little spot in a painting without it 
the painting is good with that one little mark called the dragon's eye. Boom, it activates the entire painting. And, and master artists use that all the time, especially if you learn how to use color. If you know how to place what we call the soloist just right, bam, it's like a light switch. It just turns on all the color in the, in the, in the image. And, and it's weird. You can put your finger over it and the, the image dies. It just, mm, it deactivates and you reveal it. And it's like, boom. It's, it's pretty magical. So those are the kinds of things like that happen in your, in those meetups, you know, you, you talk about story, you see other people's um, uh, approach to, to that. But because you have this common language, you know what they're talking about and you're able to communicate back to them, you know? So um, it's, I just find it kind of magical. It's kind of cool. It's really cool. Uh, but um, how many hours uh -huh. a week, if you take the course, how mm -hmm. many hours a week are, are committed to that um, or expected? Um, so I want to fit it in with put as much as you want in it. I have uh, an 80 day curriculum and on there it'll say, watch this one video today, you know? So, okay. Uh, you know, do this and depending on how you approach it, it could be 15 minutes. It could be two hours, you know, depending on who you are and how, and if, okay. you know, and you could squeeze that thing down to 20 days if you really wanted to, or you could take it out for 16, you know, um, 160 days. It's really at your own pace um, okay. And then again, with the meetups, you're going to quickly begin, you know, within two months, you're going to be like, oh, okay, this, this makes a lot of sense because you're going to be hearing it and you're going to see people who are just starting out and people who've been there for a while, you know, you're going to see people who move through one painting slowly mm -hmm. and you're going to see other people who are like banging out five paintings, you know, <laughs> and, and so you're just going to okay. see all these different types of people right and then you figure out where you are in that mix do the meetups start right away if you um enroll with the course uh yeah actually if you enroll today right mm -hmm. uh you just have to go to core80.com hit the little button sign up pay and you're done um you will automatically get in, um access to the first module, there's four modules, okay? There's story, line, space, value. Um, I used to have where you get everything and then people would just watch it and they just, it would just overwhelm them. And so we want you to actually, you know, be quality people. So you just focus on story. In seven days, the second module will drop, okay? Where you learn line strategies, and then it goes on from there. And then between each stage, each module, um, once you do story and you have your story concepts and you have your energy maps and your thrust maps and all that stuff together, then you will, will schedule um, a one-on-one -on -one with a reviewer. And they basically, actually in this case, it would be with Bill. Um, he's the first reviewer. And he'll just have a conversation with you. There's five questions you need to answer before you meet with him. And so that gives you a structure to the conversation. Um, and, and then he, you know, he's, if you're doing it right, he's going to give you that affirmation. He's, he's always going to push you a little bit deeper, make you think about things differently. And then you move on to the next stage, which is line. Um, I'm the reviewer at this time for that because that line is really my, my strong suit. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, then you move into space, which we'll get into the golden section, um, you know, divine uh, dynamic symmetry, the grids, all that kind of stuff. And you'll meet with Martin. And after that, you will go through the value section. And then you'll meet with um, Julie, who's out of Australia, and she'll um, review your value work. And, uh, and, and that's really the composition process, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and then with the meetups, you'll, you'll get started right away. So um, we have three days, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sundays at this time that we meet. And so you'll just pick the, the time that best, that's best for you. Um, I would be willing, if, if the four of you sign up, 
I would be absolutely willing to create a meetup just for the four of you. And then I would bring in maybe one or two of the people from the academy just so that you had, you know, so, some more experienced people in the group. Um, and that would be totally cool. So you guys could just say, you know, Wednesday nights or whatever, whatever it is that works really well for you guys. And then you guys can grow together, you know, so that would be something I'd be willing to do. Uh, if not, you just go into one of the meetups that are very generous. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, the, the, the key to composition is relationship. You know, you're managing your relationships. So if you guys already have a relationship, you know, it'd be kind of cool for you guys to go through this at the same time and develop that language, encourage each other, you know, it's what mm-hmm. it's about. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that would be neat. Yeah. But you do go at it at different paces depending on schedule. Yeah. You know, we give you a structure, um, an 80-day curriculum, but, you know, this isn't like, oh, you're going to get an A, B, or C. You know, you're going to go at your own pace. And, you know, uh, you're going to, even if you go a little slower or a little faster, like I said before, you're going to be around other people. So you're going to be able to see, oh, wow, look at that person's using value. You're going to be seeing people use value three weeks before you even get to it, you know? So the people in the meetup don't have to be all be at the same stage of taking a course. Absolutely. And that's why we call it like a family, you know, because you're going to have little brother, you're going to have big sister, you're going to have mom, you're going to have whatever, you know, and, you know, you're going to see people at all kinds of different stages of of their development, you know, and that's, that's to me part of the magic of it. So... It seems like there's a lot to be learned seeing all different stages of different people are doing and where they're at. I'll be honest. I'm still shocked by how much there is to learn. You know, Bill and I were, Bill and I were just, you know, um, uh, figuring out today a whole nother depth of all of this today, you know, in terms of, uh, identifying personalities and enograms and all kinds of things like that to kind of empower people to be able to communicate their ideas better, um, as well as enable you. See, your success is our success, right? So the way I envision this is just not, it's not good enough that you can compose and have a great painting. Like my heart is like, I want to make you guys sell if that's what's interest, if that's what is of interest to you. Right. So how do you do that? Once you have, you know, in any business, you got to have solid product. That's what I tell artists all the time. Well, you, you know, you can learn all the business classes you want, but sorry, but the product sucks. Right. You know? <laughs> so let me help you make the product great now. Okay. Well, what's next? You know, can you sell? Do you have confidence? You know, so a lot of the people who come, you know, they're, they lack confidence. They're good at what they do. I remember Charlene, I said, I gave her an honest compliment. I'm like, wow, that's great. And she just went like, oh, you can't see me. But she kind of like shrunk into herself. And, uh, you know, we had to go through a little exorcism, pro- you know, right there in the spot. It was like, I told her, you knocked that crap <laughs> off, woman, you know? So with her, we had to create a, a, a trigger. But every time she got a compliment, she was forced to, to give a thumbs up. You know, just a small thumbs up, just something different than her typical response, which is this little cowarding away. Um, if you come into the academy and you say, you know, I'm sorry, but I try, we, I'll yell at you. You don't, you don't come in saying you sorry. <laughs> if you made an, an, an intelligent mess, you should be proud of that. <laughs> okay? And... <clears throat> Let me tell you, ladies, when you can tell somebody and articulate why every line in your painting exists, why it, why it starts where it starts, why it ends where it ends, why the direction in which it goes is important, and you can articulate it in a way that people get it and they see it, that's power. Hold on. I'm sorry, Kathy. I'm waiting for you. 
I have to go. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. In, when duty calls, being a mom. Mom duty calls. Awesome. Right. Have a good one. Bye. 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 See you guys. Bye. We'll see you soon. Bye. Um, Bye. Yeah, I really did come online today thinking, oh, man, my goal today is one hour. Just one hour. <laughs> uh, it's much longer than that. I'm going to have to go, too. So, um, yeah. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, just email me um, and uh, or talk to Barb. She, she, she knows a couple little things that are going on here. Um, and if you want to just get started, go to core80.com. Just click the little button, enroll, and you'll get started uh, in – Five minutes so that's as simple as Do you that send an assignment every day for 80 days well it's not, not yes <laughs> if, if 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 you want to approach it that way okay um i just so i'll be honest i don't really feel it from any of you but the reason why i created oh <laughs> forgot this is going to be recorded <laughs> whatever the reason why I created it was because um, there was an energy in a couple of the students that were a little too uh, random and erratic, right? And and they were and it was um, it was draining my time and my my energy. And I was like, "Ooh, you know, we have to create a system that co that cares for all kinds of people." And I realized that. Um, by giving them uh, a curriculum of what to do, when to do it, it just allowed them to grow, right? So it's there, but it's not a rule, right? It's a principle. So you can take it. It can help guide you through. Um, you can talk to the people in your meetup, uh, but it's there to kind of help guide you through the process. But it's not like, oh, you didn't do this. You're going to lose out, you know? All the information's there for you. It's just kind of giving you, a, it's just pacing you through it um, on an 80 day schedule. But if you go faster, you go faster. You know, you want to go slower, you go slower. Cool. And if you go slower, you can go slower. So if you can do it a couple of times a week. And hey, the reality is this there will be some sections that you will hear for the first time and it will click. And then there will be sections that you're going to be like, was I dropped on my head? You know, because I ain't getting, you know, and it's going to take you a little time before you get your aha moment, you know. Um, so, okay. You know. Like me on the storyline. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. But Connie, when you go into value, you're, it's going to be a no-brainer for you. <laughs> you already have, like, that sensitivity. You know, and uh, Deborah, I see you becoming a master of line. You know, I think when you get into the gridding, you'll do well with it. But um, I'm but intrigued it might, by it. Yeah. But it might be a little more of a challenge, you know. I think Barbara's going to have a, a tremendous challenge. Well, I don't know. I, I, I envision you having a little bit of a challenge with the gridding um, because it's going to be very tight. Right. Um, but at the same time, when you went and you started talking about, you know, having to restore those paintings, mm -hmm. you spoke with such enjoyment and such authority on it that you actually might tap into that kind of nature. Now, I know part of it, you know, in your mind, you want to separate that from your artwork, right, <laughs> at some level. But um, but there is a section of, of, of the process that kind of gets you know, you're putting together a puzzle, a puzzle, and you're figuring it out, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. there's, so there's going to be parts where you're just going to click, it's going to resonate with who you are, and then there's going to be other parts that are going to be a little bit of a challenge, you know, and, and my job is to watch you um, figure out how to make a bridge so that you can get over that hump, you know, easier, and in doing it, then I, I systemize that to help a whole bunch of other people who are like you, you know? So one of the reasons why I have the grid the way they are is because the grids were very, very confusing for people who didn't spend 15 years with them, you know? So I had to basically just put it on paper and then 
And I did it for one of my, my students. And then he called it the composition calculator. He's like, this thing's brilliant, man. Mm-hmm. And, and it's been about two years and I'm just starting to get what he got. Right. I'm like, Oh my God, this is like a calculator, you know, <laughs> it's cool. Cause I don't think in math and I, I'm starting to now, but I'm like, Oh, this is cool. Like he saw it, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, no, anyways, it's, it's, it's all good. Mm-hmm. Any last questions? Thank you, Victor. Appreciate all, right. all of your time and energy yes. um, and learned a lot as always. Awesome. Do you guys have any problem if I post this on Facebook? It, no, I'm no. fine with it. Yeah. All right. And I'm going to take Kathy's absence as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I'll uh, talk to you guys later. See you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Rita says bye. <laughs> <laughs> Funny.